جمهوری اسلامی ایران یکی از کارآمدترین سازوکارها را در سیانت از حقوق بشر در اختیار داشتید. We cannot stay silent. We must find ways to stop them covering truth and lying. Я сказал все, можете кричать, уходи. Turn up the volume as loud as we can. Speaking with one big voice. Excellencies, <clears throat> courageous defenders of human rights gathered from around the globe, ladies and gentlemen, friends, welcome to the 2023 Geneva Summit for Human Rights and Democracy. My name is Hillel Neuer. I'm the executive director of United Nations Watch, one of, one of 25 human rights NGOs that is co-sponsoring today's event. <clears throat> we meet this morning on the occasion of two anniversaries. Across the street from us at the United Nations, we're celebrating the 75th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. <clears throat> it was adopted in 1948, right after the atrocities of the Nazi Holocaust in World War II, in response, as written in the preamble, to barbarous acts which outraged the conscience of mankind. Its purpose was to reaffirm faith and fundamental human rights in the dignity and worth of the human person and in the equal rights of men and women. Seven decades later, later our task here today is to bring the promise into reality, to protect victims of oppression and to hold their abusers to account. That is why we are here today marking another second anniversary. This is the 15th year in a row that our coalition has organized the annual Geneva Summit for Human Rights. A gathering of dissidents, defenders of human rights, former political prisoners, and family members of current political prisoners. We must stand with these courageous people because seven decades after the Universal Declaration, it seems all too often that the dictators, the authoritarians, are getting more and more shameless. From Havana to Harare, Nicaragua to North Korea, Moscow to Beijing, we're witnessing repression, gross abuses, and atrocities committed around the globe. Now, for most people, it's natural when facing the jackboot of oppression to be cowed into silence. That is human nature. But the individuals you will hear from today directly or through their family members because they're in prison, are exceptional. They chose not to be silent. Instead, at great risk to themselves and to their families, they've chosen to take on dictatorships and abusers to dedicate their lives to upholding the principles of freedom, justice, and human rights, the freedoms that we all hold dear, our principles. 
In China last week, they sentenced Kofi Shon, known as the barefoot lawyer, a self-taught advocate for human rights victims, for the oppressed. No other lawyer would take them on in China. Kofi Shon, they just sentenced him to eight years in prison. Today, we'll hear from his son, Peter. China is repressing a fifth of humanity, 1.5 billion people. We need to hear about it. In Tibet, they're forcibly assimilating the youth in schools, and we'll hear from Jalo about that. In Hong Kong, they're crushing one of the last great outposts of democracy in Asia. We'll hear from Francis Hoy, a young activist who's been on the front lines. In Xinjiang, they've herded more than a million Uyghur Muslims into camps. And we'll hear from Survivor, Kalbinur Siddiq, and activist, and our partner, Dalkun Issa, himself, personal victim of persecution in China. In Russia, one month ago today, on April 17th, they convicted Vladimir Karamurza, my friend, who stood here five years ago, receiving our Courage Award. He's one of the country's most prominent dissidents who dares to speak out and protest Vladimir Putin's regime. He spoke out against the war, and they threw him into prison a year ago, and just a month ago, convicted him to 25 years in prison for treason because he spoke out. In a moment, you'll hear from his wife, Evgenia. Now, in Zimbabwe and Africa, they're throwing journalists and activists in prison. We'll hear from one of the most famous former political prisoners, Fadzai Mahiri. Also in Africa, but it's not only there, there's female genital mutilation affecting millions. We'll hear it's not only in Africa, it's also in Europe. And we'll hear from Marie-Claire Kakpotia, a survivor who's fighting back to stop this atrocious practice. In Afghanistan, the Taliban terrorists a year and a half ago swept the country, banning women from work and schools. Girls can't go to school. Nila Ibrahimi managed to escape. She's only 16 years old. She managed to escape their clutches, and we're going to hear from her in a moment. She's here to bear witness. In North Korea, the dictator Kim Jong-un spends all his nation's resources on producing nuclear weapons. People don't have food. They're spending the money on nuclear weapons to threaten and blackmail the world. The people are suffering poverty and oppression, atrocities in the prison camps, the labor camps. And one of the survivors of this oppression who managed to escape, Song Mi Han, she wrote a book about it. She's fighting back. She's fighting for her people, and she's here with us, and she's going to tell the story. In Iran, they just hanged two individuals for blasphemy on social media. All they did, something on social media, they were hanged. And they're threatening to hang three more protesters in Isfahan. This is a regime, the Islamic Republic of Iran, that is beating, blinding, torturing, raping women for the crime of protesting for their basic human rights. They're poisoning schoolgirls because they protested back in the fall. And with us here today is a woman who five years ago dared to remove the compulsory hijab, the headscarf. She protested on the streets. She became famous, known as the Girls on Revolution Street. They threw her into Evan Prison, the notorious prison. They threw her into solitary confinement. She managed to get out. She escaped. She's with us here today. Her name is Shima Baba A. She'll be receiving very soon our Women's Rights Award. We'll hear from leading international voices against the Iranian regime. Adrien Gomi of the Assemblée Nationale of the French Parliament. Ali Reza Ahondi of the Swedish Parliament. Ali Essasi, Chair of the Foreign Affairs Committee of the Canadian Parliament. And we'll hear from Dr. Nargis Eskandari Grunberg, the mayor of Frankfurt. When she was 17, 18 years old, she too back in the 80s, protested Ayatollah Khomeini, the regime, fighting for women's rights. They threw her into prison. She was there for a year and a half. She managed to get out. Today, she's the mayor of Frankfurt, one of the most important cities of Europe. And she used her position to name a street, just recently, name the street where the Iranian consulate sits in Frankfurt, Masa Amini Street, the name of the woman who was arrested for improper hijab and who died in custody. Now that's Masa Amini Street in Frankfurt. 
Vladimir Putin is crushing the Ukrainians, bombing them day and night. He's crushing those who dare to speak out at home. We're going to hear from renowned Ukrainian novelist Andrei Kirkov, who wrote a diary of the invasion when he was in Ukraine. We'll hear from Anastasia Shevchenko, the first person to be convicted in Russia under the undesirable organizations law because she dared her too, like Vladimir, to confront Putin's regime. In Cuba, there was a crackdown a year and a half ago. A thousand people were arrested, many students, because they dared to march for democracy. They have fake trials thrown into prison. We'll hear from someone who himself, a journalist, Abraham Jimenez Enoa, he dared to speak out. He was persecuted by the regime. He's here to tell the story. We'll also hear another kindred regime, the Maduro regime. They went after Hasler Iglesias. He was a young democracy activist. He had to go into hiding. They tried to arrest him. He managed to flee. And he'll be, he'll be, he'll be with us here today. He's with us to shed light on the realities of what's happening under the Maduro regime. And finally, not, not least, just a few years ago, we had Felix Maradiaga was here speaking at our Geneva summit from Nicaragua, one of the leading dissidents who confronts the dictator Daniel Ortega. He went back to Nicaragua. He dared to run for president against the dictator. You're not allowed to run for president against the dictator. They threw him into prison. He was 611 days in prison in solitary confinement, suffered terrible things that he hasn't yet told the world about. Just a few months ago, he was released. A year ago, while he was still in prison, his wife, Berta Valle, was here to speak for him. They're both with us here today. And um, Felix will be receiving our Courage Award. These stories, we're hearing about oppression, harrowing accounts of suffering, but also inspiration. These are people, extraordinary people, who chose not to be silent. They're fighting for the principles that we all believe in around the world. And if you let dictatorship spread, we pay the price. It spreads. We see that we ignored Russia, and now it's in the heart of Europe, and Iran is helping Russia to kill people in Ukraine. The dictators are uniting, and the purpose of the Geneva Summit, among other things, is to allow those resisting the dictators, the defenders of human rights, for them to meet, for them to collaborate, and to unite. We, the democracies, have to unite. We at the United Nations need to unite against the dictators. So everyone who's here today, we're here to stand with those who refuse to be silent. We must not be silent. We must listen to their testimonies, do what we can to stand with them, show solidarity. You all have social media, whether it's Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. We're putting the messages out for the Geneva Summit. Amplify their stories, share it, take a stand. May this summit be a catalyst for change, a forum where ideas flourish, a testament to the resilience of the human spirit. Together, let us stand against oppression, challenge dictatorships, and pave the way for a world where every individual can enjoy the rights and freedoms they deserve. Thank you, and let the 15th Annual Geneva Summit for Human Rights begin. Before we hear from our opening speaker, Evgenia Karamurza. I'd like you to pay attention to the screen where you'll see her husband who stood on this podium several years ago and hear just a clip of his powerful message. Thank you very much. It is an honor for me, a privilege, and really a distinct pleasure to be able to present to Vladimir Karamirza the Moral Courage Award, as I said, for a person who is the embodiment of moral courage. As so often in our country's history, the political cost and the personal cost of dissent in Russia today is high. Twice in the past three years, in May of 2015 and again in February of last year, both times in Moscow, I experienced symptoms of severe poisoning that left me with a multiple organ failure in a coma and on life support. It was certainly intended to kill. Both times doctors told my wife that they estimated the chance of survival at about 
The message was clear enough, but so is my response. Now for the second time, you will not see us run. You will not see us hide. You will not see us give up. As Boris Nemtsov always said, this is our country. We have to fight for it. And if we be really believe in our principles, we must be prepared to stand up for them. Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, good morning. I am deeply honored and deeply humbled to be standing on this stage today where my husband, Vladimir Karamurza, stood in 2018 when he received his Geneva Summit Courage Award. Just like Vladimir five years ago, I get to share this stage with the most awe-inspiring, fearless, indomitable human rights fighters of the world. But every single one of them, no matter how brave, principled, and strong, is also a human being. And there is nothing more precious than a human life. The cost of freedom is high used to say Boris Nemtsov, the leader of the Russian opposition, my husband's mentor and friend, who was assassinated under the Kremlin walls in 2015. I think about it a lot these days, about the fragility of human right, of human life, and the incredible strength of human spirit. I think about it Indeed, as Eleanor Roosevelt said, you gain strength, courage, and confidence by every experience in which you really stop to look fear in the face. I thought about it when I watched Belarusian women take to the streets in 2020, dressed in white and carrying flowers in a beautiful act of female solidarity to call on Alexander Lukashenko to quit. I think about it when I see Iranian girls dance and sing in defiant protest against their oppressors. I think about it when I see the Ukrainian people unbent and unbroken despite all the pain and misery of endless loss caused by the war of aggression launched by the Russian state. I think about it every time I frantically search the news the media for news about Masha Maskalova, a Russian girl whose father, Alexei, was thrown in prison because his daughter drew an anti-war picture at school. And the Russian authorities deemed her father unable of raising a strong Russian patriot. In her letter from the orphanage to her father in prison, Masha wrote, you are the best dad in the world. There is no one better than you. Please don't give up. You are a hero, my hero. I think about every single one of those thousands and thousands of Russian citizens who stood up to the cruel and all-powerful state repressive machine, armed only with the truth and human dignity, knowing quite well that they could face punitive psychiatry, like journalist Maria Ponomarenko, or sexual violence, like poet Artem Kamardin or endless torture of solitary confinement like Alexei Navalny, or a Stalin-era prison term of up to 15 years for a simple no to the war, like municipal deputy Alexei Gorinov, artist Alexander Skochelenko, activist Natalia Filonova, political scientist Evgeny Bistuzhev, 
lawyer Dmitry Talanta, politician Ilya Yashin, award-winning theater director Jenny Berkovich, playwright Svetlana Petrichuk, and dozens and dozens of others. I could read these names and tell you these stories for hours. When last year, the Moscow Regional Court stripped environmental activist Arshak Makichan of his Russian citizenship for opposing the war in Ukraine, he said, and I quote, the Russian state stripped me of my one and only citizenship. Many would say that I should be glad because I am officially no longer a part of the state that rapes and kills women and children in Ukraine, occupies 20% of Georgia, and tortures its own citizens. But the Russian state is not the entire Russia, and I cannot stop being part of the country that I love. Being the wife of a true Russian patriot, I know exactly what he means. In April of last year, my husband, my best friend, my soulmate, joined the ever-growing list of political prisoners in the Russian Federation. A man to whom decisions come easy because his values are clear. A warrior, a patriot, a man who refuses to keep silent in the face of political, in, in the face of atrocities, no matter the risks. A man who has for years been giving his voice to hundreds and hundreds of political prisoners in the Russian Federation before becoming one himself. A man who was designated as a foreign agent by the Russian authorities and as a prisoner, as a political prisoner by Russia's most respected human rights organization, Memorial, who became the laureate of the 2022 Václav Havel Human Rights Prize and was sentenced to a quarter of a century of strict regime by the Russian state. In his last statement to the so-called court, Vladimir said, and I quote, I'm in jail for my political views, for speaking out against the war in Ukraine, for many years of struggle against Vladimir Putin's dictatorship, for facilitating the adoption of personal international sanctions under the Magnitsky Act against human rights violators. Not only do I not repent of any of this, I am proud of it. I subscribe to every word that I have spoken and every word of which I have been accused by this court." End of quote. But this fierce warrior is also the father to our three kids, and that makes it a very personal story, the story of our family. Just like the war in Ukraine that really began in 2014 with the annexation of Crimea, this nightmare entered our home in 2015 when Vladimir was poisoned for the first time. The attack plunged him in a coma. He had a multiple organ failure and suffered a stroke, but survived against all odds. Our oldest daughter was nine at the time. Her siblings were six and three. And they watched their father relearn how to carry out the simplest tasks, like buttoning his shirt walking or using a spoon. When the oldest one turned 11, the story repeated itself. Again, a coma, a multiple organ failure, as the result of a second assassination attack. Later, thanks to a brilliant investigation by Bellingcat, the insider in Der Spiegel, we learned that both attacks had been carried out by a team of FSB officers, a team of assassins, in the service of the Russian state, the same team that had been following Boris Nemtsov before his murder and that poisoned Alexei Navalny with Novichok. Today, our son is 11. His sisters are 14 and 17, and their father was just sentenced to 25 years of strict regime in a Kafkaesque trial in Moscow. They say that you should lead your kids by example. There is no point in talking to them, no point in making elaborate speeches with many arguments. They simply won't hear. At a certain point, you become background noise. But they do see. They watch you closely. They see the way you act as a partner, 
as a parent, as a member of a community, as a citizen of your country, as a citizen of the world. They watch and they learn. So every time I see fear and sadness, but also fury and defiance in their eyes in the face of atrocities committed by the Russian state, I keep thinking, this is my kid's father leading them by example, teaching them to stand up for themselves and those they love, to face bullies with courage, to never give up without a fight, and to be prepared to risk a lot to defend their principles, teaching them to stay true to themselves no matter what. As a parent, I know that this life lesson, although incredibly painful, is also vitally important. Asking for a 25-year prison sentence for my husband, Prosecutor Loktyonov, made a very revealing statement. He said, and I quote, this is our enemy who must be punished. In a way, he told the truth. Indeed, Vladimir rejects everything the Putin regime stands for. The lies, the tyranny, the terror. And the fact is, all throughout history, dictators have underestimated the strength of human spirit that I believe serves as the foundation of that courage that President Roosevelt described as not the absence of fear, but rather the assessment that something else is more important than fear. That courage that has time and again proved stronger than violence and military might. Thank you very much. My name is Ethan Perret, and I am a student in Geneva. The empty chair on this stage is dedicated to Jimmy Lai, a pro-democracy newspaper owner in Hong Kong and a political prisoner. Lai arrived in Hong Kong at the age of 12 as a stowaway on a fishing boat. He set about educating himself, reading voraciously as he rapidly promoted to factory manager. He launched his own fashion brand and became a multimillionaire. Yet, when China sent tanks to massacre student protesters in Beijing's Tiananmen Square, Lai began a new path. He printed t-shirts showing the faces of student leaders and started writing articles critical of the Chinese Communist Party. The regime responded by trying to shut down his stores. Lai decided he needed a new formal platform for his message. He created the newspaper Apple Daily, an allusion to the biblical story of Adam and Eve and the tree of knowledge, an apple a day keeps the liars away, an early slogan proclaimed. Over two decades, Apple Daily built a reputation as one of Hong Kong's most trusted news sources. Lai's outspoken criticism of the regime made him an anomaly among Hong Kong's business elites, for whom aligning with Beijing was simply good business. Lai's refu refusal to tow the party line made him a target for assassination, and his home was firebombed several times. In the wake of the 2019 pro-democracy protests, they came for Jimmy. 
On the morning of August 10, 2020, more than 200 police officers raided the headquarters of Apple Daily. Lai, then 72 years old, was dragged out in handcuffs. They shut down the newspaper. Today, Jimmy Lai remains trapped in solitary confinement. In December, they sentenced him to five more years in prison. He now waits trial on even more charges. It is clear that Beijing wants him to spend the rest of his life in prison. Today, all together, we all say to Jimmy Lai, the world has not forgotten you. Good morning, dear friends. In 2016, on this very stage, I said, long live the troublemakers. Today, I want to say, long live the freedom fighters. <laughs> exactly one week ago, the Chinese government sentenced my friend and a prominent human rights defender, Guo Feixiong, to eight years in prison. His crime was publicly appealing to China's leadership for permission to leave China to go to the United States to spend the last minute with his dying wife. I leave to his son, Peter, to tell the story of his father and his family. One month earlier, the Chinese government handed it down to another two friends, two prominent leaders of China's citizen movement, Xu Jiyong and Jing Jiaxi, prison sentences of 14 and 12 years respectively. Their crime was a private meeting and a public statement criticizing Xi Jinping's COVID policy. These three cases are but the tip of iceberg of the Chinese Communist Party, the CCP's persecution of the people of China. We have lost the count of numbers of people languishing in China's prison for crimes of exercising basic rights enshrined in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Indeed, human rights violations have skyrocketed in China since Xi Jinping came to power. Under his rule, 
China continues to leave large fingerprints on the canvas of human events. Regarding human rights, these fingerprints place China at the scene of countless activities, both domestic and international, all thoroughly outside of the norm of civilized, responsible world power it so desperately claims to be. To review China's despicable human rights record, we need to look no further than communities that my fellow panelists represent today. Tibet faces new and worsening challenges from the CCP's repressive rule, threats to Tibet's linguistic, religious, and cultural heritages have increased staggeringly in recent years. Now, as an example, an estimated 80% of all children in Tibet are separated from their families and educated in the massive system of colonial boarding schools. This cultural genocide is a deeply troubling manifestation of the CCP's ongoing program of forced assimilation of ethnic and religious minority groups. In 2019, 60 years after Tibet, an autonomy under the 1951 forced agreement of one country, two system was fully colonized by the communist China. Hong Kong, another autonomy under um, the one country, two system framework was to be plunged under a national security law. It has rapidly lost its freedom, the rule of law, and the civic culture, becoming another Shanghai in the political sense. This is a political genocide. Millions of Uyghurs are suffering from unspeakable atrocities at the hands of the CCP. This includes forced sterilization of young women, enforced separation of families, and placement of children in state orphanages, and mass incarceration of more than one million people since 2017 in detention centers and forced labor camps. Uyghurs are also being transferred to factories in China proper and used as modern day slaves. The case for genocide against the Uyghur people has been made through documentation of evidence by credible international human rights and academic institutions, as well as from numerous profoundly intimate and chilling first-person accounts. Today, we will hear one of them. Now I want to return to the three imprisoned democracy leaders mentioned at the beginning. For each of them, the current incarceration is not their first. For Xu Jiyong and Ding Jiaxi, this is the second time. For Guo Feixing, Peter's father, uh, is third imprisonment. This demonstrates that despite the extreme darkness, many in China have continued their fight for a brighter China. But their efforts and their sacrifices are often underappreciated, with many observers concluding that China will remain authoritarian indefinitely. But the perseverance, the determination demonstrated by these brief freedom fighters and the dramatic white paper movement of last year, late last year, have shown change is possible. That change, however, requires international focus on and international support 
for the courageous people who struggle, demand struggle for freedom and democracy on a daily basis. Thank you for providing us the opportunity to speak truth to power. Indeed, as loving freedom individuals, organizations, and countries develop their strategies, policies with regard to engagement with China, they should listen to the people who share their values, the same values. Not only that, but also continue fighting on front line for these values. Now, let's hear our extraordinary speakers. Let me begin with Peter. Thank you very much, Dr. Yang. So I am here today to speak for my father, Yang Maodong, who goes, who's more known for his name, for his pen, pen name, Guo Feixiong. He is a writer, a publisher, and a self-taught legal activist, or barefoot lawyer, who championed freedom and democratic values in China. But because China is not free, because China is not democratic, He's been in prison for the majority of my life, 12 out of the last 21 years. And just a few days ago, he was sentenced to another eight years in prison. I haven't seen him in person since I was five years old. And I don't know when or if I'm going to see him again. This is my story, our story, of how the CCP tore our family apart. When I was young, I didn't know him as a human rights activist. I only knew him as my dad. When my mother was out of town, he would take care of me. One day, he just stopped coming home. I found it strange he would disappear like that. When I was six, I was eager to go to elementary school with my friends. But my mom told me I was not allowed. I was sad and frustrated. A year later, I found out officials denied me education because of my father's human rights activism. Then, when I was six, I was eager to go to Elem oh, wait. As the Chinese government kept persecuting us, my father decided that we should move to the United States. I was only seven at the time, and I barely spoke a word of English. But I was able to pick up the language and adapt quickly. During that time, my father was serving a five-year sentence after publishing a book about a recent Chinese political scandal. In prison, he was beaten, shocked, and deprived of sleep for over a week and tortured repeatedly. When he was released in 2011, we talked over the phone a lot. He encouraged me to exercise and read about Chinese history and Chinese literature. Come August 2013, he stopped replying to our messages. We were worried he was detained again, but the Chinese authorities were completely silent until a month later, when they announced he was imprisoned for gathering crowds to disrupt social order. This time he was sentenced to six years. His health deteriorated. He couldn't trust the food he was given because he felt ill after eating. He began a hunger strike in protest. My mother was so worried that she'd reach out to American officials to send a request to the Chinese government for a prison transfer. It worked. He was transferred to another prison where he was treated better. His sentence ended three years later in 2019. I was 18 then. I was much more interested in understanding his character and his beliefs. I wonder how he stayed motivated to keep working even after he was repeatedly arrested and imprisoned without a fair trial. He told me he's driven by his sense of duty. His honor, nonviolence, and fairness. And even after everything the CCP has done to him, he's loyal to his Chinese identity. He constantly reminds us that we might live in America for now, but we are Chinese. 
He is a Chinese activist who wants to reform China to make it a better place. He doesn't just want to westernize China. In January 2021, I was 19 years old. My mother was diagnosed with late stage colon cancer. My sister and I were shocked and devastated, especially because for the last 11 years in America, she'd effectively been a single mother raising us. My father was desperate to see her, so he sent a letter request to the government to visit her. Of course, the Chinese government denied his request, but it did not deter him. He reached out to his contacts in the US to get her into the best hospitals possible. He asked for donations and fundraised online to help us pay for her cancer treatments. Chemotherapy was very hard on her, but she endured. She really wanted to see her husband again. She believed that with his tenacity and his connections, she would make it ha he would make it happen. Just as she was starting her second round of chemo, he got his passports and visa corrected to come to the US. It gave my mother so much hope. But when he got to the airport, they wouldn't let him on the plane. He, pro said, he protested and he was arrested and put in jail for a few days. When my mother heard this, she was devastated. As my mother's condition worsened, my dad had to make more drastic measures. He started to speak to famous activists about being denied the right to visit his wife. But then we stopped hearing from him. A month later in January, she passed away without ever getting to speak to him again, nor knowing his whereabouts. She spent the last month on earth without her husband. When my mother was alive, she would always been her, his advocate. She was a doctor in China, but in the US, she worked minimum wage jobs to feed and house us. In her spare time, she would do everything she could to get him out of jail. Now, with my mother gone, it's up to me to fight for my father's freedom. Two months after her death, the government finally announced his imprisonment for inciting subversion to state power. Upon hearing of her death, he started a hunger strike to protest China's refusal to let him see her. They forced fed him in prison. The only person he could see is his lawyer. He has lost a ton of weight. He is a man of average height, but by August 2022, he was just down to, eight, to 48 kilos, or 105 pounds. That same month, we contacted officials and diplomats from several countries. They recognized his innocence and pushed Chinese officials to release him from prison. China mostly ignored these demands. They say he is in prison for subverting state power. But the truth is, he is in prison because he spoke up about being denied the right to visit his dying wife. Think of how cruel and inhumane that is. Every day in prison, he suffers. As a committee that values human rights, we must take action. Every time he's been in prison, he's been tortured so badly that he has no choice but to start a hunger strike. And just this week, he was sentenced to another eight years in prison in a blatantly unfair trial. He is planning to appeal, but he needs international help. He needs your help. So I ask you to speak up, to take action, on behalf of my brave father, Guo Feixiong, and defend the rights of this human rights defender. Thank you.
Thank you, Peter. Incredible story. Our next speaker is Dr. Gil Lo. He is an academic expert on China's mass use of boarding schools to eradicate Tibetan identity and culture. Now, Dr. Gielo. Dear brothers and sisters, in 2015, I finished my PhD uh, in the sociology of education at the University of Toronto. Then I returned to Tibet. Late next year, I got a phone call from my brother. He said, hey, Jalo, I need you to come back home to check on my two doctor, daughters. Strange things are happening with them. I don't know how to interpret it. On a Friday afternoon, I went to pick up my two grandnieces from their boarding school. But this was not just boarding school. It was a boarding preschool. They were only age four and five years old. And this was an entirely new policy in Tibet. When those two little girls got home, I closely observed them and the way they interacted with their family. They didn't hug anyone. There was no emotional exchange. They were silent, distant, and almost like a strange or a guest at, at their home. And I'm here to tell you today that all of this is by design. China's mandatory boarding school will destroy Tibetan culture and identity if they are not stopped. Like a gardener ripping out the tree from the ground. The CCP is trying to completely cut off Tibetan children from their cultural roots in order to eradicate us forever. Around 1995, when I was uh, teaching, uh, teaching at university, I noticed that my undergraduate Tibetan students were speaking Tibetan fluently in class. But one turn they turn in the into right written assignment. Their grammar was strange. I asked why. They said, this is the way we learn from our school. So I got their textbook and they realized that they were poorly translated from Chinese textbook. I thought we must write our own textbook. I organized a group of people, the principals, professors, and the students to ask how should we teach child literacy in Tibet. Together, we came up with an outline. And then it was my job to write the book. I collect oral history from different villages, transcribe it, and edit it. In 1999 and 2000, we, when we distributed the book to the school around the Tibet, the kids were so happy. And their parents keep, kept asking to borrow their book. Parents said, wow, your school is teaching this? You have to go every day. Their enthusiasm and the pride in our cultural the relevant textbook and on our own language majorly increased daily attendance. In 2009, when I heard a rumor that China was planning a mandatory preschool program, 
in Tibet for children aged four to six. I thought we must get ahead of this. Let's bring everyone back together to discuss what we would want as a mother tongue based curriculum and give our recommendation to the Chinese government. But I was in Canada when Xi Jinping announced a new preschool policy. And it wasn't until I saw my grandniece that I realized that their boarding preschool curriculum was worse than everything we could have imagined. So for three years, I traveled across Eastern Tibet, visited more than 50 boarding preschools, meeting with students, principal, and local people, and I was witness it was nearly identical to my grandniece's experience. Students are forced to speak in Mandarin. Teacher can only use the CCP approved textbook. Every day, it's a lesson like this. So when those four and five eight years old children got home, they have almost nothing in common with their parents. Nothing to talk about, almost like they were raised in a foreign country. When I asked my brother, what would happen if you don't send the girls to the boarding preschool? He teared up and I said, the girls will be blocked from the getting an education for the rest of their life. Even if most Tibetans don't agree with this policy or Beijing's curriculum, they have no choice. This is why one million Tibetan children are in boarding school today. And this number means that three out of every four school-aged Tibetan children now live separate from their parents and in the control of Chinese state. As an educator, I call, can tell you that China's pedagogy is very advanced. They are brainwashing an entire generation of Tibetan kids so successfully that they won't know how to practice their own language, culture, and religion in their homeland. The Communist Party is trying to force our Tibetan children to become Chinese. If this continues, then China will end Tibetan's 5,000 years old civilization. In September 2020, after so many years of advocating for the right to receive a Tibetan education in Tibet, I began to face serious political consequences. I tried to fight this, but a well-known lawyer recommended that I live quietly right away before I'm in physical dangers. I was shocked. It, it feels so sudden, but I packed up all my things and had the last dinner with my family. I told them I can't stay here anymore. It is possible we won't see each other for the rest of my life. But I couldn't bear to tell my 80 years old father the truth. So I just said, I have to go, but I will be back soon. Today I live with my wife and daughter in Canada. And I have watched the Canadian Prime Minister and the parliamentarians and even Pope Francis apologized for forcing indigenous kids into the residential school. And yet today, in 2023, China is intentionally recreating the genocidal system in Tibet. And it's nearly 10 times the scale. The only thing that will stop Xi Jinping and the Chinese Communist Party is the international pressure and the sanctions. We must force them to end this practice or Tibetan will cease to exist. Thanks very much. This is my flag, represents my whole nation.
Well, thank you. To the chair, thank you, Dr. Gielo, for your presentation. Our next speaker is Frances Hui. She is the first Hong Kong activist uh, granted political asylum in the United States. She is a policy and advocacy coordinator of Committee for Freedom in Hong Kong Foundation and the director of We the Hong Kongers from the organization. Now let's welcome Francis Hui. Hello everyone, it's an honor to be here to share the story of Hong Kong and the friends in Hong Kong. Um, very happy to be speaking with you and um, I hope you guys um, had learned more about China and the CCP with our panel speakers today. I want to start with a statement that a lot of you may find confusing or even controversial which is Hong Kong has never been free. First, it was part of the Chinese empire. Then it belonged to the United Kingdom for 150 years. And even in 1997, when the United Kingdom handed over Hong Kong to China, the people of Hong Kong were not consulted or included in the negotiations. Hong Kong has never been free. I was born in 1999, just two years after the handover, when Hong Kong became part of China as a special administrative region. China promised one country, two systems, so that Hong Kong will not change for 50 years and Hong Kong people are to run Hong Kong. To this day, Beijing and Hong Kong authorities have tried to paint a picture to make the world believe that Hong Kong is a free society, that it is an international financial center protected with rule of law. But the people of Hong Kong have woken up to these lies, and we are fighting for our democracy. My story starts when I was 10 year old. I saw um, a documentary on TV about the Tiananmen Square massacre. I saw soldiers shooting at unarmed citizens and driving tanks into the crowd. I saw students covered in blood on makeshift stretchers, rows of bodies covered in sheets, <clears throat> excuse me, and a man curled up on a sidewalk in the fatal position with his skull cracked open. It is shocking no matter how old you are, but especially as a 10-year-old. So I went to the annual vigil on June 4th, and Hong Kong was the last place in China that could honor the victim. It was my first experience seeing people freely gather to express themselves, and it left a profound impression on me about freedom of speech and freedom of assembly, both values that define Hong Kong yet ceased to exist in mainland China. In the summer of 2014, when I was 15 year old, the CCP announced a new election scheme to narrow the people's already limited rights to elect our chief executive. Student leaders like Joshua Wong called on students to walk out of classrooms and take to the streets and let their voice be heard. I joined a walkout with thousands of students. We rallied in front of the government's building headquarters and eventually occupied Hong Kong's busiest highway. That day, police launched 87 tear gas canisters towards students and peaceful demonstrators. They chased us, beat us, pushed us back again and again, but we didn't give up. We wore helmets and goggles held umbrellas to shield ourselves from pepper spray. All we could think about was standing our ground against police aggression. I was beaten with a police baton, and I was pepper sprayed in the face. 
As I was standing in the midst of tear gas smoke, I looked at the people fighting alongside me for the same democratic values. I saw there was a community, community built up where strangers looked out for each other and became neighbors in tents. We were all there to defend our home and our freedom because we are Hong Kongers. I am a Hong Konger. And although we never achieved universal suffrage, this movement completely changed my life and the landscape of Hong Kong civic society. In 2019, the Hong Kong government proposed an extradition law that would violate our judicial independence to allow anyone, anyone in Hong Kong to be extradited to China and be put on trial under Chinese law. Millions of Hong Kongers took to the streets and came up with five demands the extradition law to be repealed, justice for peaceful protesters who were detained, attacked, or died from police aggression, and the right to elect our own official, as promised in the basic law. Once again, the government ignored the people's voice and increased state violence against protesters. Police started shooting straight into the crowd with bullets, they took siege of a university campus, blocking thousands of young protesters from food and medical assistance unless they surrendered. Throughout the movement, 11 people had died from committed suicide. Dozens of others disappeared, and over 10,000 people were arrested. Our city was deeply wounded. We were left together glued together by pain, anger, and tragedy. And as a final insult to the people of Hong Kong, China imposed a national security law in 2020 to criminalize any individual under succession, subversion, terrorism, or collusion with foreign forces, facing up to life sentencing in Hong Kong or mainland China. Immediately, I was warned that I was on the government's shortlist of people who would be arrested. I was only 21 year old, and I had to make this life-altering decision in 48 hours. I was torn just from thinking, should I stay in Hong Kong or leave? Would I really get life in prison, in solitary confinement? Or would it be better for me to leave Hong Kong and be voice of my friends in prison? Late at night, I decided to get on a plane. And I still remember, as the plane took off, I was looking out to the lights of Hong Kong through the window, thinking, this might be the last time I will see this beautiful city, my home. And within weeks, they had imprisoned 47 of the most inspiring leaders from the movement. And now they're facing the possibility of life behind bars. Media outlets were forced to shut down and journalists like Jimmy Lai was put in jail. So many Hong Kongers were forced to flee the city they call home. In 2021, I secured asylum in the United States. Meanwhile, there are thousands of political prisoners in Hong Kong, with, a, with the youngest only 13-year-old. The words political prisoners and political asylee are the two labels I never imagined would apply to Hong Kong people. But I'm afraid this is the reality of Hong Kong today, a reality that the Chinese government and Hong Kong government both tried to cover up. And even when I am in the US where I am supposed to be safe, me and my friends have been bullied, intimidated, threatened by the CCP. The same has happened to Hong Kongers, Uyghurs, Tibetans, Taiwanese, and Chinese in dissidents all over the world. We cannot accept the status quo. We must hold China accountable and let Hong Kong be Hong Kong. CCP's authoritarianism is one of the biggest threats to world order and democracy, working next to other bad actors like Russia, Iran, and Burma, just to name a few. I don't want to ask the question about why China is still on the UN's Human Rights Council, because many of us have asked that question in the past too many times now, and it is still what it is. 
but the least that the international community can do is to advocate for the release of political prisoners in Hong Kong and alleviate their suffering. It only takes all of you sitting here today, world leaders, journalists, activists, and people of conscience to say their names. Say Jimmy Lai's name, say Joshua Wong, Gwyneth Po, Owen Chow's names, raise their public profile, make them famous, and put pressure on the CCP to release them. In the movement, we used to wave a flag that reads, restore the lights of Hong Kong. This is the revolution of our times. Today, this flag and the slogan are banned in Hong Kong. In 2016, the activist behind this slogan, Edward Leung, said, it is always darkest before the dawn, but just know that the dawn is about to come. Today, years have gone by and the dawn is yet to come for Hong Kong and for many of you here that are experiencing autocratic oppression. But I believe on the darkest day, we can all light a candle for one another to make the night brighter and warmer. Together, we can restore the lights of Hong Kong and the lights for this global pro-democracy movement so that one day, all the political prisoners will be free and we will be able to set foot again in our dear home and we can declare united glory to democracy and glory to Hong Kong. Thank you. Thank you, Francis, for your powerful message. Next, we will hear Kabina Siddiq. She is a Uyghur activist and witness to Chinese re-education camp atrocities and a survivor of forced sterilization. Good morning, dear guests. I would like to thank you for your time. Right now, there are over 3 million people in concentration camps in East Turkestan. The government will say that those numbers are exaggerated, that they're re-educating Muslim terrorists and political dissidents. It is a lie. I've worked inside those camps, and I'm here to tell you what I witnessed with my own eyes. By the end of my story, I think you'll agree, there's only one word to describe what's happening in China, genocide. I'm a Chinese language teacher from East Turkestan, what the CCP calls Xinjiang. And after 20 years of 28 years of teaching on February 28, 2017, the president of my school called me into his office and said, go to the party committee office tomorrow at 1.30 p.m. You have an important meeting. I asked what about it, but he didn't know. 
I showed up and recognized a few other teachers from our district. The party secretary of regional education department, Song Li Ying, closed the door and said, we've just started a new semester and we've gathered a number of illiterates for you. Starting tomorrow, March 1st, you'll teach the national language Mandarin Chinese to them at designated locations. When you go there, don't tell anyone what you saw, what you heard, or what you knew. Keep it very confidential. Don't mention it to the school leaders, principals, or even your co-workers, friends, and your family members. I thought that was strange, but before I could ask, Song Lee said, Kalbenur teacher, your daughter is in the Netherlands, right? The Netherlands and China have very close relationship. I knew what it was, a threat. I had no choice but to accept their offer and stay quiet, so I signed my name and stamped my fingers with ink. The next morning, a police officer picked me up and drove me to the designated location. It was a four-story building inside a compound with walls covered with, in barbed wire and a series of strong electric doors. The policeman tapped a car to let me in and a female worker asked, Teacher, are you ready? We can bring in the students. I said yes. On the right of the corridor, the th unlock, they unlocked three doors, one with an electronic keypad, one with regular padlock, and a third intertwined with by wires. She shouted, class is starting, class is starting. And I saw that 97 so-called illiterate students coming out of their cells. They were older adults with chains on their hands and feet. My heart started pounding. I felt totally despair and hopelessness, but I was surrounded by armed police. My name is Kalbenur, I said. I will teach you the national language starting today. And then I quickly turned to the board to start writing Chinese vowels because I, because I knew if I looked at them much longer, I would break down crying. Later in the lesson, I noticed eight surveillance cameras in the room. It was the longest and scariest hours of my life in my teaching career. At 12 o'clock, we went outside and the female workers said they were going to distribute the detainees food. I want to help too, I said. They agreed. They started scooping out rice soup, but it was almost entirely water. I started handing out Chinese buns, one piece per person. I gave two elderly people an extra piece and didn't think it would be a problem until someone yelled, A Ben is missing! There was a momentary panic, but a worker said it must have been the kitchen's mistake. She told me everything is carefully counted and asked me to not to help again because I almost put them in danger. I was horrified. As the weeks passed, there was a constant influx of near prisoners. I thought six to seven hours a day to a different group every hour. From the numbers printed on their uniforms, there must have been over seven to 8,000 8, detainees. They didn't shower. Each floor had just one toilet and there was one limit to use them. And they slept on the cold concrete floor. One time, I went to pour myself a cup of tea and a worker came running at me shouting, hey teacher, don't drink that. I asked why but she didn't have a good reason. I started suspecting the water. Even the most healthy inmates were losing weight dramatically. Over time, many of my students disappeared. They allegedly died on the way to the hospital. After six months, my contract ended and I was so relieved. But then I was called for a new job. Starting September 1st, 2017, I teach at the women's camp in Tugang. It had six floors with at least 20 cells per floor, roughly 10,000 inmates in the building. At a simple glance, the women looked like men, wearing orange vests with numbers printed on them. Every Monday, they would be administered unknown medications. As a result, 90% of the women who are aged between 18 to 48 years old would stop menstruating. My Chinese friend told me that, that they would bring women in an interrogation room and force them to confess to crimes they'd never committed. Then four to five police officers would rape the girl one after another. They'd take an electric rod and stick it into her vagina 
or rectum to torture her. I was supposed to teach at the women's camp through March, but in November, I got sick. And I, when I went back to my school in February, I was forced to retire with the excuse that I didn't complete my duty. Two months later, I got a message from the neighborhood committee at the and the police informed me that I have to go to the police station in Chang Luoyan Hospital to undergo a sterilization surgery. All women ages between, aged between 18 and 59 must be subjected to birth control procedures, and if you don't get it done, you and your family would be punished. In October 2019, with my own efforts, I left for the Netherlands where my daughter lived. I started testifying in February 2020, after I gave interviews to international media, such as The Guardian, BBC, CNN, my family started receiving threats, including my husband. On February 18, 2021, I got an unexpected call on WeChat from a Chinese police officer. He passed the phone to my husband, who was angry. He said, I don't want to have anything to do with you. From today forward, we're divorced. I knew immediately that he was being forced to say that by the police. Then, one month ago, I found out that my older brother had passed away. He, fent he went to the hospital for a cold, and the next day he died under mysterious circumstances. The CCP won't just ruin your life, they will go after your entire family too. I can only say so much today, but let me be clear. The Chinese government is systematically torturing, sterilizing women, separating families, enslaving Uyghurs in forced labor factories, and murdering the people of East Turkestan. The Chinese government, again, is systematically eradicating the Uyghur people of East Turkestan. A genocide is unfolding against millions of Uyghurs and Turkic people. We cannot stay silent on this genocide. We must act. We have to stand against the Chinese Communist Party. Thank you. Thank you, Kabiner. As we watch, the CCP routinely detain its best citizens. As we watch, the Tibetan identity is gradually losing. As we watch, the free Hong Kong is gone. As we watch, China, the Chinese government kill Uyghurs in great numbers. We must stop watching and begin actions we must stop China from committing these atrocities. When it comes to human rights, there's no such a thing as a neutral position. You must choose side. I am Yang Jianli, I approve this message. Thank you. Let's join me. Well, uh, in thank you our speakers for their courage to share their difficult stories. Thank you. <clears throat>
Two years ago, I woke up in an overcrowded jail cell in Zimbabwe's maximum security prison. No water, no toilet, no underwear, no dignity, and no rights. Inmates ate watery porridge with their bare hands because spoons are not allowed. Before lights out, we had to line up in queues for roll call. Group A, B, C, and D. D was for dangerous. And even though the other women there had committed crimes such as murder, armed robbery, and infanticide, I alone was put in the dangerous group. I had committed the dangerous crime of tweeting, tweeting against police brutality. Local police had been captured on camera, smashing a baton stick into the windshield of a small public transport bus. In the video that went viral online stood a woman crying and grabbing the policeman by his collar. She was sur surrounded by a mob of people yelling that the policeman had killed the baby. The baby lay motionless and pale in the woman's arms. And by all accounts published online, the baby had died, yet the state denied the death. In the face of public outrage, the police themselves issued a statement that they would investigate. I joined the country in calling for justice. I tweeted, condemning the act of rogue policing and the unconstitutional and disproportionate use of force that had obviously caused the death of a child. Thousands tweeted about it, but they targeted me, a vocal opposition politician, for arrest. They alleged that I'd lied that the baby had died. The violent policeman was never brought to book. And so this is how I wound up in a maximum security prison, charged with communicating falsehoods prejudicial to the state. This offense has long been struck off the statute books by Zimbabwe's constitutional court. However, in a nation where the government is constantly at war with its citizens for demanding a better society, human rights don't seem to matter. The legal system is weaponized as a tool to silence, intimidate, and harass. I was convicted four weeks ago and narrowly escaped a 20-year prison sentence. I walked away from the ordeal knowing that unless there's true change in how Zimbabwe is governed, we are all serving a collective prison sentence. Nobody is free. The experience was more stark for me because I came out of the womb knowing I'd be a lawyer. I love to talk, I love to argue, and despite growing up under Robert Mugabe's dictatorship, the ideals of justice and fairness became the dreams my older self would pursue. Life would later provide me an opportunity to work for the United Nations War Crimes Tribunal for Rwanda and for the International Criminal Court in The Hague. And it was during these times that the need for truth and justice for Zimbabwe's own 1982 genocide, infamously described by Mugabe as a moment of madness, came again to the fore. Prosecuting crimes against humanity and war crimes in places such as Darfur, the Eastern Congo, and the Central African Republic brought Zimbabwe's own oppressive reality into sharper focus for me. Ours has been a slow-burning struggle for democracy, following a liberation war of independence that provided the illusion of freedom, but no tangible sign of its much-needed fruit. Over time, I've come to learn the complexity of history, that those who were once modeled as heroes can eventually morph into the very villains they once fought. Colonial oppressors and post-independence dictators have that one thing in common. 
They both play from the dictator's playbook, and it's the citizens who suffer. But just like the international courts and tribunals I worked in, where there is injustice, there is also hope that a few good women and men will fight the cause of injustice wherever it may lead them. And so in 2016, after returning to Zimbabwe and upon completion, my, completion of my studies in international work, the government announced the return of the world famous Zimbabwean dollar. I was horrified. But I also saw, for the first time, an opportunity to speak publicly truth to power. I stepped out of my comfortable, safe, professional world into the more treacherous world of political doers, actively calling out the injustice and illegality. And before I knew it, I'd entered the dictator's arena, naively paving the way for the dangerous political journey I now find myself on. Inspired by Van Mawarire's This Flag campaign, I experienced an awakening. He started a movement that urged Zimbabweans to speak up, demand accountability, and be active citizens. I registered to vote, I attended protests, and I, and I got arrested, but kept going back because of the clarion call that we must all be relentless in the pursuit of what is right. Soon we realize the limits of activism. Movements sure get people excited, but they cannot change the political system. Only active, ethical political partic participation can drive lasting social change. And so when most women my age were getting married and starting a family, I announced my candidacy as an independent member of parliament for the constituency of Mount Pleasant. I ran for office under the tagline, be the change, for it is only when individuals step out and are counted that true change takes root. We must intentionally shape the world into a better place and not just accept it for what it is. I believe that if our campaign could just inspire hope and a thirst for change, i change everything. But the person I changed the most was myself. I eventually lost the parliamentary seat, but gained a cause undoubtedly bigger than myself, a pursuit for justice and fairness that goes deeper than the law, but is personified in the everyday lived experience of the ordinary Zimbabwean. I've seen hope in action as I've proudly taken on the role of spokesperson for the country's main opposition party, the Citizens Coalition for Change. And in spite of the violence, arrests, and manipulation of the legal system, we will fight to win Zimbabwe for change in the upcoming election against numerous odds. I stand here today to let the world know that Zimbabwe is currently reeling under a dictatorship much worse than Robert Mugabe. Half the population lives under extreme poverty, 2.2 billion US dollars are lost to corruption annually, and we have the highest hyperinflation rate in the world. All because those in power would rather loot and persecute than lead. The government's war against freedom and its weaponization of the law against myself and other government critics, such as Job Sikala and Jacob Ngarivume, are calculated to send a chilling message to the rest of society. We're watching you, even on Twitter. And this is the punishment you get for participating in opposition politics. To date, both these brave men remain political prisoners, but we won't stop demanding their freedom. And we call on the world to do the same. In closing, I wouldn't risk my life in freedom if I didn't sincerely believe that change is possible. Courage doesn't mean that you're not afraid. It means that you act in spite of your fear because you believe in a greater cause. And I choose courage and choose hope. This August, Zimbabweans go to the ballot box with one simple mission, 
to win Zimbabwe for change, to install ethical, competent leaders who believe in dignity, prosperity, and freedom for everyone. The world must insist on this election being free, fair, and credible. The will of the people has to prevail. It's difficult, but we must emancipate the jewel of Africa from the imprisonment of its current dictatorship. Hope and action are the sustenance of those who change the world. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm incredibly honored to be here today with you at the Geneva Summit. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to share my story. It was August 15th, a beautiful sunny day that soon turned dark and cloudy, casting a shadow over the lives of millions of Afghans, especially the girls and women of my homeland. I had woken up early to study for my last mid-year exam at school, scheduled for the next day. A few hours after breakfast, my mother heard from the neighbors that the Taliban had reached dasht barchi the district where we lived, and may take over Kabul soon. My mother had lived through the civil war and the first Taliban regime, and had made me understand how miserable and frightening that tourney was. And now, her worried eyes and shaky hands made me even more scared. We ran to destroy our family documents that could put our lives at risk because it was expected that the Taliban would come to house-to-house -house searches. My father, a former government worker, passed away a month after I was born. So the photos, uniforms, and documents were the only memories I had of him. As I watched them burn and turn to ashes, it was as if they had never existed, as if he had never existed. My school certificates as well. I felt so angry and sad to be told to destroy them that I decided to take the risk of keeping them. I knew all of this was only the first spark of a fire that was about to consume our whole lives. The weight of the situation was overwhelming and fear took hold of me. My mother is a great person, but she belongs to the generation of women who were subjugated by the Taliban. This created in them a mindset that they had no right to say no, no right to protest or stand up for themselves. They were made to feel like they were incomplete human beings without a man. Now, there were rumors that the Taliban would marry young girls. I felt helpless and scared for what the future held. I am Nila Ibrahimi, a 16-year-old women's rights activist. My journey of advocacy started when the Kabul Education Directorate banned schoolgirls school over the age of 12 from singing in public. As a member of the Sound of Afghanistan music group, I found this decision disappointing and aggravating. We were singing for peace, women's rights, and humanity on different stages and well-known TV channels. In some parts of the world, there are societies that welcome teenage girls who are using their voices to make changes. However, when I heard about the ban, I realized a sad fact about my society. There were people who wanted to silence me solely because of my gender. I had to stand up for my rights for the first time in my life. So, I recorded a video of me singing a song as a call to action for all girls and women. Murtaza, my brother, posted it on social media alongside the hashtag I am my song, and it soon went viral. The movement successfully reversed the decision. 
Later that year, before the fall of Kabul, I was watching President Joe Biden's briefing on TV regarding his country's withdrawal from Afghanistan. I vividly recall him sharing the story about his visit there, where he had conversations with several girls. One of them had told him, if you leave Afghanistan, I will no longer be able to pursue my desire to become a doctor. She urged him not to abandon Afghanistan. Upon hearing this, tears welled up in my eyes and my heart splintered as I could truly empathize with her feelings. She understood the imminent situation and was desperate to hold on to her dreams. Unfortunately, her plea fell on deaf ears. As a 16-year-old, of course I'm not aware of all the political complexities, but why couldn't the U.S. have at least negotiated some form of peace, some form of peace, instead of abandoning the country without any resolution? So now, the dream of that girl, along with the dreams of millions of other girls and women, was shattered overnight when the U.S. and the international community abandoned Afghanistan. The Taliban, a group with a regressive mindset that deems being a girl or woman a crime, took control in a chaotic and shocking manner. <sighs> to capture my emotions, allow me to share an excerpt from my diary written the day after Kabul fell. It doesn't matter when I wake up anymore because I cannot close my eyes at night. I see everyone terrified of an uncertain future. At breakfast, no one speaks. After breakfast, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. I can't study. Why should I study now if I am not allowed a future? Humanity is dead all over the world and I am tired of everything. In our airports, People died from stress, heat stroke, dehydration, from being crushed and their desperation to get out. Taliban are everywhere. Some people say they are going to go to every single house to search for guns or take some girls. I am wearing a long dress and covering my face. Am I going to be forced to cover my face all my life? Am I going to be locked up in my home Forever? Five days after the fall, my family decided to flee to Pakistan. We were lucky. After eight tense months, the 30 Burst Foundation helped us resettle in Canada. While I feel safer in my new home, every single day, I think of those girls left behind in Afghanistan, left with no hope. In Canada, I make decisions about my life and embrace the person I aspire to be. But what about them? As I stand here today, I want the world to know that girls have been out of school for 640 days. Universities are also closed off to them. Women have been stripped off everything. Their education, their freedom of movement, their right to work, their choice of what to wear, and their ability to participate in public life. This is a grave injustice that denies them their basic human rights, rights that should be afforded to every individual on this planet. I am in awe of the immense bravery displayed by Afghan girls and women who have steadfastly fought for their dreams in the face of the Taliban's oppression. In the darkest of times, hope becomes our lifeline. It is our collective responsibility to be their hope, to stand with them, and to take action. So I ask you, all of you, be part of this movement. And I ask those of you who have the power and the influence to please lend your voice and actions to support the Afghan girls and women. Let us unite and prove that humanity's strength lies in its compassion and unwavering commitment to justice. The time for action is now. Thank you.
My name is Maya Breckenridge, and I'm a student in Geneva. The empty chair on this stage is dedicated to Jamshid Sharmad, an, Irani an Iranian-born dissident, resident of the US, who was kidnapped by Iranian regime agents, convicted of corruption on earth, and now faces execution. Sharmad was born in Tehran and moved with his family to Germany when he was seven years old. He is a German citizen. A software engineer, Sharmad moved in 2003 to California from where he ran a website opposed to the Islamic Republic of Iran. In 2009, according to the US State Department, Iranian agents tried to assassinate Sharmad. In August 2020, while he was in Dubai on a stopover between flights, Iranian agents abducted and smuggled him into Iran. There, he was brutally tortured and forced to confess responsibility for a 2008 bombing in Iran. His kidnapping was one of several such incidents where Iranian dissidents with foreign citizenships were lured into traps and brought to Iran for sham trials. For the Islamic Republic of Iran, hostage diplomacy serves a dual purpose, crushing dissent and using the hostages as pawns for diplomatic leverage with Western governments whose citizens it abducts. It has been nearly three years since Jamshid Sharmad's disappearance. In February, following a grossly unfair trial, Jamshid Sharmad was sentenced to death. Meanwhile, the regime delays his access to medications required for his Parkinson's disease, resulting in severe body aches and difficulty breathing. His health has severely deteriorated. Today we say to Jamshid Sharmad and to other dissidents suffering in Iran, you are not forgotten. It's a great honor to stand before you today as we gather to celebrate the courage, moral leadership, and devotion of those who tirelessly work towards the advancement of women's rights. This year, at the 15th annual Geneva Summit for Human Rights, we honor an exceptional individual whose relentless pursuit of justice has made a profound impact on countless lives. The inspiring Iranian activist and former political prisoner Shima Babae. In 2017, while she was a student of architecture in Iran, Shima's name became synonymous of the Girls of Revolution Street demonstrations that took place across Iran. She risked her life and liberty to protest, protest for women's rights, openly defying the law that forces all women to wear a headscarf. She also rallied in support of political prisoners. As a result, Shima was repeatedly summoned, arrested, and jailed by Iranian police. She was sentenced to prison for the crimes of removing the hijab in public and publishing indecent material on social media. In February 2018, Shima was subjected to 21 days of solitary confinement in Tehran's Evin prison. She was interrogated 14 times. She was denied access to legal representation. Shima and her husband, Dariush Zand, a fellow activist, were charged with assembly and collusion against national security, propaganda against the state, and publishing falsehoods on social media. Facing six years of imminent imprisonment, the couple fled Iran in late 2018. Now based in Belgium, Shima continues the fight beyond her country's borders against gender discrimination. When the death in custody of Masa Amini sparked mass protests in September 2022, Shima became a leading voice of the diaspora. She told CNN, 
as the very same building, at the very same building in the morality police headquarters. They treated me as a criminal, put me in handcuffs, and disgraced me. In November, Shima was one of four Iranian, Iranian activists invited to a landmark meeting with French President Emmanuel Macron. Shima is now fighting for the release of her father, Ibrahim Babae, a human rights activist who has been forcibly disappeared since December 2021 when he tried to flee Iran. For years, he was brutally punished for his peaceful protest and for supporting his daughter's activism. Human rights activists are calling for his immediate release and at least for his whereabouts to be disclosed. Eleanor Roosevelt once said, in the light of history, it is more intelligent to hope rather than to fear, to try rather than not to try. For one thing we know beyond all doubt, nothing has ever been achieved by the person who says it can be done. Despite so many hardships, Shima Babae is a woman who has chosen hope over fear. She dreams of a world where women are treated equally, and she fights for that dream. Her courage and determination have made her a beacon of hope for women in Iran and around the world. On behalf of the 25 human rights groups that co-sponsor the Geneva Summit for Human Rights, I am proud to present the 2023 International Women's Rights Award to Shima Babae. Shima, please come forward to receive your award. Good afternoon, everyone. I come from a country where being a woman is a crime. Journalism is a crime. Being LGBT is a crime. Being a dissident is a crime. Protesting is a crime. Being a human rights activist is a crime. The number of crimes and restriction in my country are so high that they, there is no space for freedom. These crimes are punishable by arrest, torture, lashing, imprisonment, rape, and execution. I am here today to receive this special award because of my fight, even if this fight was not my choice. It was my duty. At the age of 14, I was a victim of the morality police for the first time. I believed that it was my duty to fight against the compulsory hijab. Ever since, I learned that a woman's voice, a woman's dance, 
and a woman's body were forbidden, I have been fighting for women's right. When my father was imprisoned, he was locked away for four years and whipped 74 times for protesting against the Islamic Republic. As a result, I could only see him once a week through glass, and I understood it was my duty to fight for the freedom of expression. When I witnessed people being executed for no reason, I decided to fight against the executions. Finally, when I saw that the government was taking the lives of innocent people because of street protests, I decided to fight against the Islamic Republic's very nature. After my fifth arrest of human rights activism, it only made me more determined to continue my fight. The clothes I wore every day to leave the house were not ordinary clothes, but war clothes. And outside the house was a butterfield. I took every opportunity to walk without the mandatory hijab in the street and I was sharing my picture on social media. It didn't take long for them to come for me. When I went to the morality police building, I was also 22 years, and I was integrated integro in the same building where Masa Amini, a 22-year-old Iranian girl, was murdered some time later. Before entering the building, I made a video of myself with my scarf over my shoulder and shared it on my social media pages. I announced that I was not afraid of being arrested or being threatened, and I was saying no to the compulsory hijab and the Islamic Republic. My father, who was with me and supporting me, was beaten in front of my eyes. We were both arrested, and he was sentenced to 74 lashes while I was sentenced to jail and fined. The judge said that the hijab is a mandatory law and you have to respect it. I replied that the slavery was also a law at one time. As a woman and as, as a citizen of this country, I not only disregard this false law, but I strive to destroy it. The last time I came out of prison, I was expelled from university. I was not allowed to work. We were banned from leaving the country, and I was sentenced to six years in prison. They wanted to put so much pressure on me that I would surrender and not be able to leave. But I was fighting to leave and be free. I was not permitted to leave the country and I decided to illegally escape from Iran. In the last moments, the border guards opened fire on me several times. For the last time, I looked at my homeland from the top of the mountain. I had to leave my motherland, which I loved so much. There I decided to fight for all those who chose to live the life of an exile until the day when their country is a safe place to live. The day when being a woman is no longer a crime in this country. The day when the answer to protest will not be a bullet and no one should be imprisoned for his opinion and no one should be sentenced to death for protesting. Today, it has been 513 days since my father was disappeared, like so many other Iranians who are seeking freedom. I realized that I had to fight harder and harder for the life that has been stolen from me, my family, and the people of my country by the Islamic Republic. 
As I am speaking to you today, many Iranians are fighting in the streets. And it is a daily exercise to achieve freedom. And they know that freedom is the only way to be saved. In the protests that followed Masa Zamini murder, at least 530 people were killed, including 64 children. And at least 500 people were shot in the eye. Tens of thousands of protesters have been arrested and more than 100 are facing the death penalty for whom have been executed so far. Their names were Mohsen Shikari, Majid Reza Rahnavard, Muhammad Mehdi Karami, Muhammad Husseini. All of them were their under 40 years old, and all were professional workers and athletes. The Iranian people are deprived of their most basic rights and have no choice but to fight back. Our revolution has not stopped. These days, despite all the repression, Iranian women go to war against the Ayatollah with their hair as a weapon. We are on road to a glorious revolution of women, life, and freedom. The protests and repression have also affected Iranian universities and school. It is a huge crime that the government is attacking the girls' school with the chemical gas to attack, to take revenge on the women. Many female students are taken to hospital because of the poisoning. I'm speaking to governments, institutions, and free-minded people around the world. Today, when the Islamic Republic is in its most vulnerable position, support the brave men and women of Iran. Treat the criminal government of the Islamic Republic as an occupier and list the Islamic Revolutionary Guard whose duty is to protect the government and kill people as a terrorist organization. Because my country is being occupied by one of the most ruthless dictators in history and my people have been taken hostage. Taking hostages has become a tool to silence the opposition and win concessions from Western governments. I thank you for honoring me with this award. I dedicate it to my brave companions, especially the Iranian women who are fighting daily against a government that is aggressively anti-woman, anti-life, and anti-freedom. They won't give up until they achieve their goal and their resilience is an inspiration to the world that is watching. The victory is ours. Woman, life, freedom.
Well, we just witnessed one of the most courageous young women in the world. Uh, we saw in the fall, in September, October, November, uh, thousands of women, girls, men, uh, who had the courage to stand up in Iran and defy the regime and face the bullets. And Shima Baba'e did this five years ago. Uh, she was, as we heard, uh, recognized by the President of France in November, in a very important meeting. And with her was someone named Roya Pirae, a young woman who uh, was, you might say, um, emblematic of the struggle taking place in Iran. Her mother was at a protest. Yeah. She was shot in the back, many, many bullets. And Roya was mourning for her mother at the cemetery and cut off her hair. It was an iconic picture. And these are the scenes that we witnessed in September, October, November. And the world was jolted by what seemed like one of the most compelling human rights causes of our time to see women and girls, young and old, leading the protests, having the courage to remove the hijab and standing on the streets knowing that they might be shot. And we've seen women blinded. One of the women we wanted to bring here was Elahe Tavoklian, who was blinded in one eye. She's now having surgery in Italy. She wasn't able to come here. Uh, really incredible people. So um, this is what we're dealing with in a nutshell in our panel today. Uh, I hope that we will uh, do three things. Is uh, We have a distinguished panel that I'll introduce in a moment. Want to first uh, understand what is this regime. I don't think everyone here in Europe uh, or in America really understands this regime. Um, people still think you can engage with this regime. Here across the street, uh, we had to reveal last week the absurd news, the shocking news, that the United Nations Human Rights Council president appointed this regime, their representative, to be the president, to be the chair of the UN Human Rights Council Social Forum in November, which is going to deal, among other things, with uh, human rights and technology after they hanged two people for uh, criticizing religion, the government, on social media. So some people, and I didn't blame the president personally, because he said he only received one nomination and so forth, but the system at the United Nations didn't find it shameful, shocking, that Iran regime could be appointed to this position. So it seems like many in the world don't sufficiently understand what this regime is about. So um, we're gonna first look at the human rights situation in Iran, uh, afterwards talk about uh, what we can do about it, what we need to do about it, we governments uh, in the free world and try to look what, what might be a future Iran post-regime. Um, we have an eminent panel with us here. Uh, let me uh, introduce them. Uh, to my right is Adrien Gomi. He is a member of the French Parliament, Assemblée Nationale. He's been central to France's response to the protests in Iran. He's a first-term MP from the governing Renaissance Party. He sits on the Foreign Affairs Committee, serves as party whip. In wake of the mass protests um, following the death of Masa Amini in Iranian custody, she's the young woman who was arrested for improper hijab, beaten, basically killed. Uh, Monsieur Gomi introduced a resolution to support the Iranian people in their courageous struggle. It was adopted unanimously in November 22. I'll also mention something that I was following when I first uh, learned more about uh, Adrien, was, you know, Iran was elected two years ago, this regime, to the UN Commission on the Status of Women uh, and was about to take its seat. And we led a campaign for two years. It picked up in the fall. The United States government picked it up, introduced a resolution to expel the regime from the Commission on the Status of Women, the Women's Rights Commission. It never happened before. There was no procedure, but they introduced the resolution. And we didn't know how countries would vote. Some governments, the Dutch 
government said, well, this is not very nice, and is this the right way to do things, and maybe we should engage and be nice to them, and w w won't be effective. We didn't know how European governments would vote. And I saw that Adrien in the Foreign Affairs Committee, when the foreign minister came, he took the initiative, he asked the question, and for the first time we heard that France would vote no. And that was very important. Um, sorry, France would vote to expel Iran. <laughs> France would, have vote, uh, would, have, would vote indeed to expel Iran, vote no to them to being, being on, on the commission. Um, he holds degrees in uh, public policy, politics, and law from Sciences Po Lille, School of Advanced Studies in the Social Sciences, uh, and Pantheon Sorbonne University. Um, Next to uh, Adrien is the mayor of Frankfurt, Dr. Narges Eskandari Grunberg. Um, she's born in Tehran. As a young woman, she dared to protest the regime uh, against their policies discriminating against women. She demonstrated for women's rights and reform. This is a number of years ago. She was arrested, locked up in the horrific Evan prison. I'll be asking her uh, shortly more about that. Tell us what she went through. Uh, recently a film came out that her daughter wrote when, uh, to tell the story that her daughter was born in Evid prison, so uh, Dr. Narges Eskandari Grunberg, as a young woman, actually gave birth in Evan prison. We'll, we'll hear more about that. In 1985, she fled from Iran to Germany. She's lived in Frankfurt ever since. She studied psychology, received her doctorate, established her own practice as a psychological psychotherapist. She's done very important work with the German Red Cross. She's helping other refugees, other political prisoners. In the city of Frankfurt, she has served as city councillor, member of the magistrate, head of the Department for Integration, head of the Department for Diversity, Anti-Discrimination, and Social Cohesion. She is now the mayor of Frankfurt, as far as I know, the only immigrant mayor of a major city in Europe. She used her position to name a street, as I mentioned, the street where the Iranian consulate sits in Frankfurt after Masa Amini. Um, and uh, she was, took, her, took her time to come very early in the morning to be with us. Really, really appreciate that. Um, uh, next to the mayor is um, my uh, good friend in combat, uh, Ali Reza Akhundi. I say that because uh, he's, I invited him here to Geneva. He invited me here to Brussels. We're trying to fight the good fight together. He is a member of the Swedish parliament, committed to supporting the people of Iran, where he's born. He emigrated to Sweden in 1992. He's been a member of the parliament there since 2018. Sits on the Civil Affairs Committee uh, and the Center Party's National Party Board. Uh, Mr. Ahondi has been devoted to social issues relating to freedom, equality, and human rights. He supported Serbia and Greece during the refugee crisis, organizing aid shipments from private donations. He helped Ukraine last year uh, in their humanitarian efforts following Putin's invasion. Since the protests in Iran, he's been a leading figure in Europe, leading the campaign to designate the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps, the notorious IRGC, as a terrorist entity under EU law. Um, I'll uh, also mention that in March, when the foreign minister of Iran came to the Human Rights Council across the street and met with, he addressed the council, he met with the secretary general, met with him, and the high commissioner met with him, and they posed for pictures. Ali Reza led a walkout that was seen around the world. It was a major um, message that he sent, very important. Uh, finally, and uh, not least, my fellow Canadian, uh, Ali Esasi is a member of the Canadian Parliament. He's chair of the Foreign Affairs Committee. It's not easy to leave those obligations and be with us. Make the long trip really means a lot. He's the son of an Iranian diplomat, obviously from uh, the Ancien Regime, the former, the former government. Uh, he was actually born here in Geneva, raised in New York and Tehran. He and his family emigrated from Iran following the revolution in 1979, settled in Canada. He was elected to the parliament in 2015, has been chair of the Foreign Affairs Committee since June 2022. Over the course of his career, he's never abandoned his heritage and the plight of the people in Iran. He's been a leading figure condemning the regime's abuses, urging Canada to refrain from supporting their terrorist agenda, an outspoken supporter of the Iranian people. Really appreciate all of you being here. Let me go for our, our first round um, to ask the mayor. Um, you've had some uh, very uh, powerful personal experiences, not unlike what 
Shima and some others have experienced. Could you tell us a little bit about your experience, what, what got you arrested and put in prison in Iran, so we can understand a bit more about this regime? First of all, thank you so much for your invitation. It's such a great place to be here, and it's really my honor to be here. It's really, really interesting to saw what happened. It's more than 37, 38 years ago. I was 18 years old as I came arrested in the prison in Iran. Most of the people of the world, they know the name of famous prison in Iran, Evin. That was really very hard time. The average age of the young women in that prison was like 17, 18 years old. We live in less than 70 square meter in a room together. There was no place even really to sleep. I was pregnant. My daughter, she came, she was born in prison. I have been there for more than one and a half year. Now when I look, more than 20,000 of prisoners, they are in Iran in prison. In the same situation, in the same situation they are fighting for democracy she much hold for just normal life. They are fighting to have freedom, for dancing, for kissing, to be on the street. They want to show their hair. And all of the similar, I think, the values, all of these rights, the human rights, it was not possible. I was in prison at that time and now how terrible is this time? I'm all the time thinking about the people in that time, and I know that the situation never changed in more than 37 years. And I'm very happy to be here, to be the voice of this woman, to be the voice of the prisoners, to be the voice of the democracy. I could escape from Iran to Germany with my daughter. She was two years old. We didn't know anybody in Germany. We came on Christmas Eve to Germany in a very, very cold night, and we didn't know even where can we go. To tell nobody, you know, Christmas Eve is, everybody is in a family, and for me it was a very difficult situation because I lost my family in that time when to be with a you know, small child in a country, it was really hard. Now, when I'm looking back, it's a long time ago. Now I'm the mayor of Frankfurt. Now, again and again, after so many years, I'm fighting for freedom. I'm fighting for democracy. I am fighting for human rights. And I'm very happy that we are fighting together on the united women. The human rights need to be united. I'm really very happy to be the voice of these women. Thank you, Mayor. Um, you experienced uh, terrible things, and you're committing your life to helping those um, who, need, who need help most. I want to ask you, if I could, when, when you were a young woman, the age of 17, 18, were all your friends demonstrating? Uh, what prompted you to, to go out and take those risks? Uh, yeah, we were demonstrating, you know, for democracy. I know this picture all the time. I have it in my head, you know. We had just a paper standing on the street, and the paper was written, you know, like a children, young and teenagers, for democracy, for freedom. And I think when I think about that, I didn't even know what is democracy and freedom, because we had never had in Iran democracy and freedom. But we knew maybe it is something very valued, we knew, knew it's something very important. And that was the reason all of the young people after the Iranian Revolution, they go to the street and fighting for that. And the terrible things, after, you know, two years, the Iranian regime, they knew that they have to be exist. They have, with torture, with murdering, put all of the young people in the prison. That's the only way that they could exist, you know? And they start very, very early to do it. 
You know, in that time, there were, I, I can tell you, more than thousands of young people, they were murdered in, in, in the jail in prison. Every night, as we were there in prison, we counted, you know, how many people were murdered in a night. And sometimes they were like 20, 30, 40, 50, a lot of, and the average age was like 20, like today. And I think when you're thinking about that today, about the young people, what did they want? They wanted just to live in freedom. They wanted to have the values, that the values we have it in Europe, the values that we have it and we are proud to have it. That was the point that young people were fighting for freedom. And now I think the time doesn't change, but I'm really very happy since September, a lot of young people, they are going on the street, they show their hair, they cut their hair, and so we are here. And I think as a woman, I can tell you, that's the first women revolution in the world, and they didn't have any weapon except their braveness, except the motivation to change. They don't have any weapon they are going, they dance, they sing, and say, we want to be free. And I think when we saw it, the time doesn't change, but I think I am really have a great hope that now it could change it. And now we are here, and I think it's really important. I'm the mayor of Frankfurt. A lot of countries in Europe, in Canada, in America, I think it's really important to isolate this regime. It's very important that all of the countries stop the economic relationship to the regime because the only way that this revolution can win, that's the support from the European, Canadian, American countries, and I hope that we are here with the summit, you can change it, the world, what happened in our countries, what happened in Iran, in other countries, and I think when we could be united against such a terror regime, I'm sure we could win. It takes time, but I think that's the only way that we could win, and I think it's very important to be the voice of the people, to be the voice of the brave women and men in Iran, in other countries, and I'm very happy this united, this voice could go out after this summit today. Thank you, thank you. Adrien, uh, help us understand a bit um, maybe what changed. You know, we had a um, uh, number of years ago in the 1980s, uh, women protesting thrown in prison. The world didn't really react in any strong way. Iran, the regime was never removed then from the Women's Rights Commission. Um, there wasn't uh, presidents meeting uh, the opposition. Uh, then we had five years ago Shima Babae. Uh, standing up. Also, the world didn't really respond. You had 2019. Suddenly now, the world is responding. What's, what is happening in Iran that suddenly now the world wakes up somewhat? First of all, can you hear me? Yeah. First of all, I would like to thank you, Hillel Nayer and uh, Geneva Summit, uh, for human rights and democracy, for inviting us to talk about this uh, crucial topic. Crucial topic about human rights in Iran. Of course, obviously, for the Iranian people, but not only, because we saw before the impact of the Iranian revolution in 1979 on uh, many other countries, so the bad impact. So we hope that um, it will be a good impact on other countries about uh, human rights. This is the first point. Um, since 1979, human rights have been violated. Um, political opponents have been uh, censored, tortured, um, prosecuted, killed. And um, of course, for decades, women have been held back by discrimination in laws and in practice. The regime, for example, enforced hijab wearing, as you know, 
with whippings. But that's, that's real, that's the reality. In fact, they aggravate the, the situation. And uh, that's what is very interesting uh, right now. Because, for example, there were many protests in the past. For example, uh, in uh, 2009, it was uh, the stolen election, which was the main cause of the protests. After, in uh, 2019, uh, it was the rise in prices. But right now, we, we can see that it's the regime. This is the institution of the regime, of the Islamic regime, which is targeted by uh, the opponents. And um, the death of Masa Amini was the symbol of this protest. Uh, and uh, I, I, I remember that she died for an alleged breach of the Islamic rules. And uh, the Iranian people said, enough is enough. And in response uh, to this protest, we saw that the security forces killed hundreds of people, hundreds of women, men, children. Um, also, they injured thousands of people. Many people have been uh, arbitrarily uh, detained because they peacefully exercise their human rights. So, um, we are now in a full-fledged human rights crisis. That's the difference with before. Today, people are fighting to bring an end to discriminatory laws and practices against women and girls. They are fighting for inclusion and equality, and that's why we need to support them as uh, MPs. Thank you. Um, let's, we're going from France, let's go across the ocean, let's go to uh, Canada. Um, Ali, you have a unique perspective because your family was uh, s serving the former republic, the former government. Um, that's actually why you were born in Geneva and lived in New York because your father served, represented Iran at the United Nations. Um, you have a particular perspective on uh, what this regime is like, unlike the other. Um, you know, Canada certainly has become more engaged since these, this, everything is happening. What's your sense of what's going on in Iran today? Well, uh, first of all, uh, Halal, I just wanted to thank you from the bottom of my heart because uh, you've had 15 summits, and every single one of those summits you have focused on the dire human rights situation in Iran. So very, very grateful for that. Also, in addition to that, as everyone knows full well, you have been engaged on this issue over the course of the past eight months, working on another, uh, a number of different initiatives. But uh, you're asking me about the 70s. Um, I would say that the Iran of the 1970s was a drastically uh, different country uh, than what we have seen over the course of the past 44 years. Uh, it would be no exaggeration for me to say that my uh, earliest memories uh, was that uh, in the 1970s, the Iranian delegation at the United Nations was very, very avant-garde when it came to uh, issues pertaining to women. In 1974, Iran was the second country in the world that had appointed a minister responsible for women's affairs. So it was the French who did it first in 1973, and in the following year, uh, Iran uh, did so as well. But in the 1970s, what the Iranian delegation at the UN was very much focused on was to put in a bid uh, and to make sure that Iran could host uh, the United Nations Convention, uh, the conference on uh, issues pertaining to women in 1980. Because back then, every five years, there was a UN conference. And given all the lobbying that did take place, they did succeed. But of course, what happened is uh, the revolution followed. Uh, and of course, uh, the, the uh, conference at the UN uh, was moved elsewhere. 
But having lived in Iran in, in those early years, uh, what I think is very important for everyone to recognize is that the first segment of society uh, in post-revolutionary Iran that stood up to the regime demanding its rights were women. There were numerous marches on the streets when women heard that the, that the new regime wanted to impose the hijab on women. And they stood up to the government, uh, and unfortunately, as has been uh, the experience of all Iranians for the past 44 years, uh, they uh, did not succeed and it was imposed on them. But I, I think it's fair to say, uh, given all the bravery, all the courage uh, we have seen over the course of the past eight years, that the Islamic uh, regime is in its twilight. What we do know is that a poll was recently conducted and 80% of Iranians said that they were absolutely done with the theocracy in Iran. So in the old days, I think a lot of Western capitals were, um, had this illusion that within the Iranian regime, there were reformers and there were conservatives. I'm here to say that is not the case. That is a charade. Um, and that Iranians fully recognize that the uh, theocracy in Iran is incapable of reform uh, and that they have just driven the country into the ground. They suffocate uh, civic rights. Uh, the economy is a basket case and Iranians are fed up and want to make sure that they see an end to this regime. So I certainly hope uh, international organizations uh, and world capitals recognize that they should be preparing for a post-theocracy in Iran. Ali Reza, you've been crisscrossing all across Europe, helping mobilize thousands of people to show up in Strasbourg and Brussels and many other places. Um, what prompted you to become so active? What was happening in Iran that said to you, you need to take this leadership role? Freedom for me is universal. Freedom is a basic human right. Freedom is worth fighting for. Freedom is worth making sacrificing for. When I saw the brutal death of Masa Gina Amini, some, some sparks um, was lightened in my heart. I thought to myself, enough is enough. Enough is enough. We have lost two generations, two generations of well-educated women and men who have been brought off every human right possible. They have lost their dreams, their hope, their trust for a brighter future. I want to start to say that I'm honored to be in this room with so many freedom fighters who works every day to make this world a little bit better. But, it's a but, we need to do more. We need to show solidarity and collective action we need to hold the Iranian government accountable for their crimes against humanity every day. Today, the Iranian regime will execute two persons. Today, while we are sitting here, two young people are going to be executed their crimes, nothing else but fighting for what we in this room sometimes takes for granted. 
Iranian presidency uh, over the UN Human Rights Summit is a shameful act for the international society. It's shameful. Where is the human dignity? Where is the Turkey Charter of Human Rights? The Iran issue is not the conflict far away. The Iranian regime have committed murder here in Europe. Right now, they are providing the Russian army with ammunition and suicide drones for killing innocent civilians. Iranian regime are active in Syria, in Iraq, in Lebanon. They are providing Hamas, Jihad, and other terrorist organization with the rockets who are bombarding the Israeli um, villages across the borders. Iranian regime are mining for bitcoins every day through digital currencies they are going around the sanctions that we are deciding about in the European level. During this past month, we have two resolutions in the European Parliament. We have seven sanction packages decided by the European Council. But we need to do more. Empty words are not enough for the woman who was present when she was 17 or 18. Empty word is not going to bring Nika, Sarina, Zakaria, Parsa, Ehsan, Kian back to life. 74 children has been killed since September last year. We need to do more. And we need to do this together. Thank you, Ali Reza. Uh, look, people listen to you, and they see what's happening in Iran, and the question is, what do we do about it? How do we make a difference? How do we fight back? What must we in the free world do to stand up for our values? Um, and there's debates. Governments have, we hear different things. Let me come back to the mayor. Mayor, you, you took a stand. You, 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 you took an action that sent a very important message. What do you think, um, what do you think our governments can do in Germany, in the European Union, in the free world? What, how do we fight back? You know, the problem is always we are talking about our values. These values is really, really important in Europe, in Canada, in America. But unfortunately, we see in the last years, our values, they are not, you know, in the first stage that they play their you know, the um, main uh, relationship to, the, to these countries, economy relationships, they are really more important than the rights and values rights, you know, and the human rights. I know, for example, in my country, in Germany, we are more than 25 years. Iran is in the rate of the third one in the economy relation to Iran, and still like that. Like, I think two months ago, it was uh, exhibition and, you know, fair trade in Dusseldorf in, in Germany. The Iranian government was represented there. They could, you know, sell everything. They could make export and import, you know, in Germany. And that's, unfortunately, the problem is all of the countries, they do it. And until you have this relationship and you're talking about the human rights, I think that's a conflict. And we cannot accept to say, okay, it's really very bad, you're, you know, hurting all of the, you know, human rights, women rights, but 
forget it. We need gas. We need relationship. We need, you know, industry. I think that's a problem we have to really, in the next years or next time, to take care of that. When really we want to fight for human rights, we have to stop economy relationship to Iran. We have to stop to see this all of the consulate general, all of the politician people, they are still in Germany and Europe. And I think when really our right is serious, we have to stop it. Because the only chance that we have to win is to isolate Iranian regime. And I think that's really important. It's maybe similar to other countries, but I think about Iran is really very important. Because all the time Iran says, okay, they're talking about the human rights, whatever. We have our relationship. We have our exporting and importing. And I think that's really very difficult. When you are dealing with this country, we are going to lose. And I think it's really important that we have to really say that's a revolution, that is a women revolution, that's a revolution of human rights. And really, when it's our value. We did it with Ukraine, the same thing. It took a long time that we say about Ukrainian, to say they are fighting for our value, and now we stop everything with Russia. That's great that this happened. Nobody could believe it that this could happen. What we do, why we didn't do it with Iran? The same thing. And I think that's the only chance that we have it. Human rights, the values, that's really then important when we, be, when we are going to be really serious to stop politician, economy, all of the relation to Iran. Then we can say we are fighting for human rights. When we are not doing, it's just talking or nothing more. And that is my demand on the countries, European countries, please stop this to support this regime. Please stop to support Iranian terror regime. Then when we stop it, we are going to win for human rights. We are going to win for women's rights. Hearing you, I'm reminded of the words of a famous Iranian activist uh, who actually received our Women's Rights Award a number of years ago here, Masi Alinejad. She said, we're not asking you, you in the free world, to save the Iranian people. We will fight, but we're asking you not to save the regime. And what you're saying is that we are doing business with the regime. Like with Putin, we were giving him billions of dollars for the gas and the oil, and we're giving money to Iran. We are empowering. We are letting them go. I just, before I conclude with you on this, I just want to ask you, naming the street, um, uh, that must have given, given a very important message and symbol, naming a Masamini street in Frankfurt. Could you say a few words about what that meant for people? It was really very important. You know, the Iranian uh, consulate general, this is in this Raymond Street. And all of the people, we have hunger strike. We have the Iranian people. Days and nights, they slept there. They were, you know, all the time present in the street. We had the idea, we want to have another name. And the name, the new name, has to be Gina Mahsa Amini. You know, I'm the mayor. Uh, you cannot change the name of street from f now to tomorrow. And we had the idea, we put the name on the street. And then we did it. Interesting was, well, the General Council of Iran, they put construction and the entrance, you know, when they wanted to stop it, that we cannot put the name on the street. We say, because I'm the mayor, I can do it. I put the, with a lot of, you know, very brave activists, we put it, the name on the street, like five centimeters before the entrance of Consulate General. And now, yesterday, the activists, they called me, they have to, you know, to wash them. And I say, no, we don't need to wash them. They can still stay. And I hope one time the street, really the name of street, in Germany, in Frankfurt, Zina, Maxa, Amini, Women Revolution. I am fighting for that. That's a good sign, that's a good symbol, and we are fighting for that.
Adrien, we heard about Germany. Tell us uh, the perspective from France. Where do we go from here? How can the free world in France and Europe stand up and give solidarity to the women, the people of Iran? Yeah, thank you. We, we need to do more, but um, at the same time, we have already done a lot. For example, last November, the President Macron who was the first head of state to describe the movement as a revolutionary, hosted four opponents uh, at Paris, in Paris, at the Elysee Palace. Uh, Shima Babai and uh, Masih Alinejad were there. And it was a very important symbol for us, for the European people. After uh, November 28th, we voted at the French uh, Assembly, at the, the, the French Congress, uh, we adopted a motion condemning crackdown on Iranian protests. And we asked, as you said uh, before, the, um, the fact that uh, we needed to exclude Iran from the UN Commission on the Status of Women. France and many other countries voted uh, for it, and that's good news. So we hacked, we need to, to, to hack uh, more, that, that's obvious, but we've done many things. And about the, the economic relationships, I, I would like to, to add something about the, the sanctions from the European Union and the Council of the European Union, because six packages of sanctions have already been imposed uh, against those responsible for repression on one hand, and on the other hand, uh, those for delivering drones to Russia in Ukraine. Actually, it means a ban on travel in the EU for the people who, is targeted, who are targeted, a freeze on any uh, assets they hold inside the EU, and the EU companies are also banned from making uh, funds available to those under sanctions. So we need to move forward, but we act. We already, uh, we have already acted. May, may I add one okay. sentence? Maybe it's okay. I think you're absolutely right. We fight for them a long time, and I think it's a lot of things happened. But the problem is it's not enough. You know, and I'm really afraid when now Iran is silent, they, the people, they don't go into the street, then we can stop it. And that's the thing that I'm really afraid of it. People because will forget. The, pe yeah, the people they were forgotten because, you know, say, in Iran, it's nothing happened. It's everything because of violence. The people, they cannot go in the street. And then all of these activities that really you're right, and I think we cannot stop it. We have to continue. Maybe one sentence, all of the demonstration that we have it on the street, I'm really very often very sad. Most of the people, they are Iranian with Iranian roots. You don't see the German people. You don't see the American, the Canadian. And we are talking about, about our values, and I hope and really, when it's serious fighting for the human rights, the people, they are going in the street. You know, when the people, they cannot go in Tehran, Iran, to the street because of violence, I accept that they are going in the street in Europe because nobody are going to shut us. Nobody, you know, doing something. And I hope when, when we are doing that in all of the Europe, in Canada, in America, then we can push the governments to do more my, you know, my problem is in that time is everything is very loud. They do the things, and after them, it's coming down, then stop it. And I hope that we will be, and it's the, I think for me it's very important to be here, that we say, don't stop it. When they are not so loud, we have to be loud here. We have to press our governments. I am part of governments in German government, you too, in all of the countries. We have to push all of the members of governments, not only with Iranian roots, the other one too. I think that's the only way we could win. And I agree with you, but we have to go more and forward then. Thank you. Thank you.
Ali, you're, you're a member of the governing Liberal Party in Canada. You're on the Foreign Affairs, you're chairing the Foreign Affairs Committee. What's your sense of, of where we can go next, picking up from what the mayor said? How do we do more? Well, I think the, uh, the one important principle we have to bear in mind, not only when it comes to Iran, but when it comes to uh, other autocracies, is that a country that tramples the most fundamental rights of its own people, that country will be a menace to its neighbor, to the world, and we should never take them at their word. So that's one fundamental rule we have to recognize. And a good example of that, of course, is as we're watching Ukrainians doing a heroic job standing up to Russia, who steps into that breach and provides Russia with drones? It's the Iranian regime. So why do I say this? I say this because far too often I have seen governments assume that they can work out um, you know, some semblance of an arrangement with Iran, but Iran has never, ever lived up to any of the international commitments it has undertaken. So that's the first principle, if I may. The second principle is we constantly see authoritarian states cover for each other to make sure that they are not held to account for their um, atrocities. I think we should learn from that experience and make sure that countries that share our values are consistently working together, are coordinated, uh, and that they uh, continue to put the pressure on the Islamic Republic of Iran and on the IRGC. These are really fundamental lessons that we should learn, we should stick to. And why do I say this? Over the course of the past six months or so, we have seen the Iranian regime, again, double down on its policy of hostage taking. They are using these Europeans that they have arrested in Iran as bargaining chips. And it appears to me that each one of these European countries are engaging in one-off deals with the Iranian regime. But if they do so, the Iranian regime will continue to arrest as many peace people as they possibly can. So just like we woke up to the travesty that is Russia, and it took us a very, very long time. First, when they attacked Georgia, we ignored it. Then when they went into Syria and committed a bloodbath with the Islamic Republic, again, we ignored it. Then they attacked Crimea, and most countries in Europe ignored it. But finally, we woke up to the threat that Russia is. I think it's high time that all of our countries and anyone who believes in our values wake up to the fact that the Islamic Republic will continue to be a threat and a menace to international peace and order. And we should listen to the Iranian people and always side with the Iranian people. Thank you. Thank you. We're, we're uh, almost out of time, but we have to hear from Ali Reza because, as I said, he's been uh, at the center of the European Union, speaking of Ali, said about coordinating action. Ali Reza, you've been calling for action. What are the actions we need to see from the international community? It depends what the goal is. If the goal is freedom for the Iranian people, then we need to do four things. Provide internet for, for the people inside Iran. The key spells Star Lake. The second thing is to break the regime's economic infrastructure, and the method is designating IRGC as a terrorist organization so we can work on sanction compliance. And the sanction compliance 
works with the banking system and the digital currency system. And the third is a global shaming campaign like the one that we did against the companies who are engaged in Russia. If we do these things, plus political advocacy in different various ways to break the chains whenever we get the opportunity, then we are going to give the Iranian people a future hope. And I want to emphasize something that Ali said. You cannot deal with thugs. These people are criminal. If you give them one finger, they will take everything. And we need to do things before Iran became a nuclear power. Our window of opportunity is not that big. And we need to act. And the key is an, not a new deal, not the new JCPOA. So please bury that idea and do things who brings the freedom to the people inside Iran. Thank you, Ali Reza. Thank you, all of our panelists. We've heard testimonies um, from Shima Baba A, from the mayor. Um, and let us all take these to heart. Let's amplify the message. They're all going to be on social media on the Geneva Summit, YouTube and Instagram. Share them. Urge your countries to take action. Let us do everything we can so that the women, the girls of Iran, the people of Iran who are struggling in the name of women, life, freedom, our values, can actually see a future Iran that is free and democratic. Thank you very much.
Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dolkun Isa. I'm the Uyghur. Despite living in the free world, I have felt in prison for much of my life. Despite being a citizen of the Germany, a country which is a freedom, democracy, human rights, and the freedom of speech are means to be governing principle, I have faced injustice. I have been detained and integrated around the world. I have continued with one object. Representation for the people of Turkestan, my people who are being forced to renounce their national identity and their religious belief in act of genocide. How did I become number one enemy of China? I still struggle with this question. I grew up in Turkestan. By the time I was born, this great land was occupied and uh, already Chinese province called Xinjiang Uyghurs Autonomous Region. In 1984, I enrolled at the Xinjiang University. I was 17. And at that time, I had not thought much about my identity. But when I read Chinese constitution and the autonomy law for the very first time, I remember thinking, wait a second, Uyghur people have a right? I start talk talking with other Uyghur students about what I have discovered. We established a Uyghur Students' Union in the university, and soon 1,000 students joined it. And we came up with an idea. What if over the holiday, we travel across the homeland, teaching Uyghur people to read, and then teaching them their rights? Most Uyghur were illiterate, and I, want, I wanted to help them wake up. So during the winter semesters, we dispersed across the region to the teach classes. When we returned to the school, we completed a 25-page report to the Ministry for Education about what we saw. For example, the students who went to the Hulja showed up to discover that Uyghur school there had all been destroyed by massive snowstorm a year ago. The CCP rebuilt Chinese school immediately after disaster, but 60,000 Uyghur and the Kazakh student had nowhere to go, so they stay home learning nothing for a year. All university students visit the schools, interview teachers, took pictures, and even recorded video, which was hard to do back then. So we thought, what if we do a photo exhibition at the university to show everyone the difference between Chinese and Uyghur school? In June 1988, we organized pro-democracy student demonstration which was attended by around 5,000 students. As you can guess, the CCP didn't like that. They put me on house arrested on the camps. A few months later, expelled me from the university. So I moved to Beijing. I studied English and Turkish for two years and ran an Uyghur restaurant. The CCP got suspicious. They asked me, why do so many foreigners come to your restaurant to eat? Well, and I said, it is because Uyghur food is so delicious. They didn't agree. They accused me of spying. And pretty soon, I realized it was no longer safe for me to stay in China. By, by then, my wife was three months pregnant. She agreed that I had to leave. 
No, so I skipped, escaped to Turkey. And six months later, my daughter was born. In 1996, I moved to the Germany. Two years later, my wife left China and sought political asylum with me in Germany. But our daughter had to stay in homeland with her grandparents. My in-law and the German government could help us get her out. The first time I saw her, she was three and a half years old. She didn't even recognize my wife. She cried all day, every day. And since the CCP never allowed my in-laws to leave the country, my daughter never saw them again. In 1997, Chinese regime announced their arresters, arrested Varan against me and brand me a killer and a criminal. After September 11, they added another label, terrorist. Yes, oppressed regime can make you criminal, even terrorist, over the night. The Interpol Red Knots was my death warrant. I was detained Switzerland, in Geneva, Turkey, South Korea, Italy, United States, and other countries. I was a terrorist. But luckily, I was never deported to China, even though so there was always a good chance. In 2013, I was set to testify at the UN Human Rights Council sections. China requests the name of the Uyghur and the other Chinese dissident who were scheduled to speak. And despite this being openly forbidden by its own rules, the UN human rights officer shared all information with Chinese authority. So they came after my family. In 2018, I learned my mother died in concentration camp at the age of 78. In 2020, I lost my mother, uh, my father, under unknown circumstances. In 2021, I learned that my younger brother was sentenced to life imprisonment. And my older brother, a length sentence on fabricated charges. I was angry, but never lost hope. I grieved, but I never give up. After Xi Jinping rise to power in 2013, the CCP changes its assimilation and the discriminatory policy in Turkestan to genocidal policy. In 2015, the CCP passed counter-terrorism law legitimating the systematic targeting Uyghurs and the other Turkish people, eventually rounding up to three million Uyghurs and the other Turkish people and detaining them in concentration camps. Uyghur children have been separated from their parents. The people in the concentration camp are being forced to renounce their national identities and they are being forced into hard labor and slavery. Since 2017, thousands of mosques have been demolished. Thousands of Quran burned. The CCP has publicly declared war on Islam, calling it an ideological virus that must be eradicated. Sadly, the Muslim world is silent. The world was silent during the World War II when the Nazis killed six million Yevish. After the war, international community promised never again. 70 years later, the CCP is committing genocide against Uyghur, but the world is still silent. My Interpol Red Notes was finally removed on February 21, 2018. Before that, all doors were closed for me. No, I have become an activist. I have testified 
and spoken at parliaments of the countries that treat me like a criminal, including U.S. Congress, European Parliament, United Nations, and several national parliaments worldwide. I have the honor of addressing you today. And in institution, I proudly serve as a president. The World Uyghur Congress has been nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize 2023. I cannot tell you how my story ends, but I can tell you that the Chinese Communist Party is not only a threat to the Uyghur, but a plague against humanity, or democratic value, or human rights, and the world politics as we know it. As China's evil hands continue to reach further into global source and penetrate the West, my future remains uncertain. After listening to my story, you will understand that yours does too. Thank you. My name is Paula Alexandrovich, and I'm a student in Geneva. The empty, the empty chair on this stage is dedicated to Abdurrahman El Sadhan, a humanitarian aid worker at the Saudi Red Crescent, and for the past four years, a political prisoner. On the 12th of March, 2018, at his office in Riyadh, Abdurrahman was taken away by the secret police. His crime? writing satirical tweets that criticized the Saudi regime, held in a secret prison, incommunicado, without charges, and for prolonged periods of solitary confinement, he was brutally tortured with electric shocks. They smashed his fingers in, saying, is this the hand you tweet with? He ended up in the intensive care unit. Three years after his arrest, a special Saudi court held a closed door trial. They sentenced Abdul Rahman to 20 years in prison, plus an additional 20 year travel ban. Last year, on this stage at the Geneva summit, his sister, Arij, who lives in California, made a passionate appeal for the United Nations to act. Several months later, in September 2022, the UN Working Group on arbitrary detention, declared Abdul Rahman's detention arbitrary and called for his immediate release. Today, as Saudi Arabia is spending billions of dollars to bring sports celebrities to play in the country and enhance their public relations, we stand by this empty chair, a reminder of the freedom and basic human rights denied to Abdul Rahman El Sadhan and so many other Saudi citizens. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my mom gave me two lives. First, when she gave me birth, she gave birth to me in 1993. Second, when she rescued me from North Korea in 2011. If there's a hero in my story, it's her. 
North Korea might be the worst place on earth to raise a child. But North Korean mothers are brave, and they will do anything to save their children. My name is Song Mi Han. I was born in rural North Korea to an affluent family. But when I was three years old, my father started beating my mom. Finally, she divorced him. And I ended up attending elementary school for only one year. And we lived in a farm with, with cows for two years. But I have the fond memories of that time because I developed such a deep relations with my mom. Two days before my 12th birthday, she said she has to leave, but she'd be back by October 10th. She wrote down a multiplication table for me to memorize. I studied hard. But October 10th went, I came and went. And I started panic. Where was she? I stayed at my aunt's house. When I heard a, a train approaching, I ran to the station and asking strangers, have you seen a lady who looks like this? And I wasn't the only one. The train station were filled with homeless children. Many couldn't even recall their mother's faces. Eventually, mom sent us a letter. Just wait a little longer. She returned to me, she said. So I waited. But life in North Korea was miserable. My grandfather starved to death. One uncle starved to death. Another uncle threw himself in front of a train. I'd walk down on the street and see dead children and dead adults. Many times, I almost starved to death and I considered suicide. Three different times, my mom sent brokers to rescue me. But my aunt warned me that I could get sold in China, or they could harvest my organs. So I stayed. When I was 15 years old, I saw my first public execution. They forced everyone in our area, including the woman's husband and four-year-old daughter, to watch as they tied her up and shot her three times. I will never forget hearing the gunshot and watching her tumble forward. I was so, so scared. When I was 17, I remember thinking, I just don't have a future in North Korea. And I really missed my mom. I had memorized the phone number of the broker my mom sent years before. So I called him and whispered, I'm ready to go there. He asked, are you sure this time? And I said, yes. I couldn't tell anyone. The broker wouldn't let me sit down, <coughs> sit with him on the train. I was so scared. Then a guard checking IDs asked me, where are you going? And I lied and told him I was visiting my grandma in Hesan. No, you are not. He said, I know you are going to China. And he started beating and kicking me. Then he dropped me off 
at the office in the train station. And a different guard tried to rape me. I pushed him and ran until I saw a group of soldiers. Please help me. He's trying to do strange things. And they scared the guard away. And I asked the soldiers if I could have some money to call my grandma. Then I ran to a pay phone and called the broker. This time, we made the border. I followed the two smugglers across the freezing cold water of Tumen River. The guards shouted us. But luckily, they missed and we made it to China. The next morning, the broker called my mom. I was so happy. I thought I'd get to see her the first time in six years. But she said she was in South Korea. I followed the brokers through China, Laos, Thailand, and I arrived to South Korea on May 20, 2011 my mom's first day. Reuniting with my mom, the happiest moment of entire my life, I couldn't stop crying. But my mom was confused. Are you sure you're my daughter? Why are you so short? My aunt had told her that I had grown so tall. It's it took me years to start healing from a lifetime of trauma. As I was preparing to give this speech, my mom showed me her diary. On August 26, 2006, my mom sold herself as a wife to a Chinese man. And then she ran away to South Korea. So she could work and save money to rescue me. I hope many children, North Korean children, waiting for their moms can hear this. They need to know they are in their mother's hearts forever. And they will do anything they can to save them this horrible regime. I tell my mom all the time, Thank you so much, Mom. You are so brave. And my mom tells me, No, Songmi, you are so brave. I'm so proud of you. Thank you so much. Do I have the right to be tired of this war? No, I don't. I am not in the trenches. I am not driving a tank to the front line. I am just a slightly displaced civilian, much less drastically affected than millions of others, and yet I regularly feel as though I am homeless. I am not, of course. My house in the village is safe. It was the neighboring village of Stavishe that was partially destroyed by Russian shelling. It was in Bucha, Borodyanka, and dozens of other towns that saw thousands of civilians killed, where women were raped whole families with children burned in their cars as they tried to escape Russian atrocities. I saw the burnt-out family minivans that did not make it to 
Western Ukraine that were not able to carry their passengers far enough away from the merciless aggressors. We made it. We left Kyiv on the second day of the new invasion with the sound of artillery fire ringing in our ears we joined the traffic jam that stretched from Kyiv to the western border, 800 kilometers. We have learned what it means to be displaced persons and what it means to be refugees. You cannot completely understand what it is until you have experienced it yourself, living in your home, knowing that perhaps you would never return, but hoping that you would be able to, perhaps in just a few days. The hope was strongest. Millions of Ukrainians were caught between hope and reality in February 2022. Fifteen months have passed since the day Ukraine was woken up by missile explosions, and I have not returned home. I have visited, yes. I went to my home in the same way that I visit my parents' grave. Like revisiting your past in your thoughts. My colleague, Volodymyr Vakulenko, an author of children's books, decided not to leave his home near Kharkiv. He could not imagine becoming a displaced person or a refugee, traveling who knows where with his son who has a learning disability. As soon as his village was occupied, he was taken for interrogation. He returned home, but several days later, the Russian military came for him again. This time he did not return. His body was identified only in November. Two bullets from a Makarov pistol were extracted from his body. He was executed in the beginning of March, and his body was put into a forest grave alongside those of hundreds of Ukrainian civilians from in and around the town of Izum. When I think of him and his violent death, I cannot help but reflect on the entire history of Russian-Ukrainian relations on the mass deportations of Ukrainian peasants to Siberia in the 1920s, the generation of Ukrainian writers and poets sent to Gulag and there executed between 1937 and 38, the deportation of Crimean Tatars from their homes on the Crimean Peninsula in 1943, and the ban on their return to their motherland which was lifted only after the collapse of the Soviet Union. Now we are all dealing with the Russian Empire that kills those who want to stay free and independent. We are dealing with the Russian Empire that imprisons Crimean Tatar activists and journalists on fabricated charges, that bans other Crimean Tatars from returning home to their homeland that has once more been stolen from them. Thinking about what Russia has done to Ukraine is painful and tiring. Writing about it even more painful and tiring. But this is what writers and journalists should do. And it is what we must do. Volodymyr Vakulenko wrote a diary. Before he was taken away by Russian troops for the last time, he buried it under a cherry tree in his garden. His elderly parents knew about this. Once his village was liberated, the diary was dug up. This is his last contribution to Ukrainian literature. It is indeed his testament. I have no right to complain about being a displaced person or refugee. I did not need to hide my diary. I left my papers at home in Kyiv, and Kyiv was defended by the Ukrainian army. My diary travels with me. 
I make entries in it most of days. And I look back at the recent times because it is easier than trying to look ahead. My future and the future of Ukraine depend on the Ukrainian army and the receipt of military and humanitarian help from our allies and partners. Ukraine is documenting crimes committed on Ukrainian soil by illegal occupiers. More than 80,000 war crimes have already been registered, but this is far from the final number. Ukrainian writers are also engaged in documenting war crimes. They are tracing the whereabouts of thousands of Ukrainian children that were kidnapped and taken to Russia and trying to find out what happened to the thousands of civilians that went missing in Mariupol, Marienka, Drushkivka and dozens of other towns and hundreds of villages which have been erased from the surface of the earth by Russian artillery and missiles. Millions of Ukrainians are still displaced. Millions are still living as refugees in Europe and America and even in Iceland and Japan. They are all victims of Putin's Russia. Like me, they have no vision of their future. We will not be able to envisage our future until the war is over and Ukraine is free. I would like to read a small extract from the Diary of Invasion a small reminder of what life for a displaced person is like, written by this displaced person. 24th of March, 2022. A couple of days ago, I cooked a proper dinner for the first time since the start of the war. We had guests my publisher from Kharkiv, Alexander, and his driver, Ivan. They were actually guests of guests, and I probably should have informed the owner of the apartment that others would be staying a couple of nights with us. But to be honest, these are not the first extra guests we have had here. A week or so ago, 46-year-old Vladimir spent the night with us. We do not know anything about him, except that he was being evacuated from Ukraine along with other people who need regular kidney dialysis. The border guards had not let him out of the country because as a man of conscription age, he lacked the right documentation from the military enlistment office. It was already late afternoon when he was turned back at the border and Vladimir had nowhere to go. Our son, who was helping at the border crossing, brought him to our place for the night. Vladimir spent most of the next day at the military enlistment office. He managed eventually to get a certificate stating that he was not liable for military service and so could go abroad. That evening, our son saw him across the border. Vladimir is already in Germany and has caught up with neighbors from his Ukrainian hospital ward. Vladimir had slept on an air mattress on our floor, and that is where my publisher and his driver slept too. We had a very good time during that dinner. We sat around the small kitchen table talking until one in the morning. From time to time, Alexander called his wife. She is almost 1,200 kilometers away in Dnipro, looking after her elderly parents. It is still relatively safe there, but it would be difficult for them to leave is Dnipro if it did become unsafe. Their sons and their sons' families are in other cities, scattered across the country like dandelion seeds. Our family has also been torn apart. There are just three of us now, me, my wife, and our older son. We continue to keep in touch with the rest of our family. It was still daylight when my publisher called his friend 
who lives in the most dangerous district of Kharkiv, where every third building has already been damaged or destroyed. The telephone connection was not very good. Alexander's friend went out onto his balcony to try and get a better connection, and immediately Alexander could hear on the telephone the sounds of distant cannonade of artillery fire. Yes, said the friend in Kharkiv. The shelling goes on continuously, and yet there are still children playing in the yard. We called our friends in Kyiv and Ivano-Frankivsk. How are you? Sounds like a stupid question, but you have to ask it. Everyone is still alive, at least the ones we could get through to. My publisher and his driver have since left for their village in the direction of Chernivtsi. I hope they were able to relax a bit with us. Now we have a friend of my older son sleeping on the floor. He was living in a refugee center 20 kilometers from us, but it was cold and the conditions were Spartan. I do not know how long he will stay with us, nor do I know how long we will continue to live in this small but cozy apartment. Nobody is rushing us. Our hostess, who now lives with her daughter, has not once asked us how long we intend to stay. Last night, I was awoken three times by air raid warnings. I now understand how these warnings are activated for the different regions of Ukraine. As soon as a ballistic or other missile takes off from the Black Sea, Russia or Belarus, Ukrainian electronic intelligence stations determine the direction of the flight and turn on sirens along the entire flight path of the missile. Nobody knows where it will fall, but all the villages and towns along its entire trajectory will hear sirens. Do I have a right to be tired of writing about the war and the lives of Ukrainians at this time? No. I will have no such right to that until the war is over, until the last Russian soldier has left Ukrainian soil. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Dylan, for that. Uh, very honored to be here. And um, thank you, Geneva Summit team, and everyone here. You are so beautiful, so courageous, so inspiring. I cried my ears today listening to your stories. So let me tell you my story. I am a politician by accident but I was always meant to be a mom. When I was 21 years old, I gave birth to my beautiful, healthy baby girl, Alina. But when I went to take her home, the doctor told me, leave her here. She's going to be disabled. I was really shocked. What do you mean? And he said, that she had contracted encephalitis and um, her brain would never function properly. Please submit a written form refusing to be her parents, he said, and we will hand her over to the state. I refused. We spent the next three years 
in and out of the hospital with her. The doctor said she'd probably never walk, talk, go to the bathroom, feed herself, and unfortunately, they were right. We struggled to get her medication, even though it was guaranteed by the state. So I started writing letters to local government, demanding better care for my disabled child. I became a journalist, an activist. I had two more children, daughter, Lada, and a son, Misha. I started working on election, advocating for freedom, democracy, and human rights. As a member of Open Russia movement, I organized protests, debates, seminars, fighting for freedom, for democracy, against Putin's regime. For my activism, I was fined and detained multiple times. In January 2019, I was arrested. I remember my children watching in horror as they searched my apartment, taking everything out of my wardrobe and throwing it onto the floor. What I didn't know then is that they had installed a hidden camera into the air conditioning unit six months prior. I was so disgusted. What kind of people would watch a woman in her bedroom? This is what Russian police does. They detained me for two, two days and then sentenced me to two years and one month of house arrest. I waited for my trial. I'd be the first person tried under a new law against undesirable organizations. The same week, my daughter Alina got bronchitis and they took her to the hospital all alone. Believe me, I literally begged judge to let me go and see my daughter and take care of her. I was showing that her body was small and weak, that she needed my assistance, that even, you know, any trivial illness could be her last. The judge smirked and said no. After they interrogated me, my lawyer told me that my daughter's heart stopped twice and she was transferred to the ICU. Finally, they approved my request to visit the hospital. I walked into Alina's room and found her pale blue. I reached out for her hand. You know, when you hold your child's hand, something magical usually happens. They instantly feel better but that didn't happen. She was cold, and in a couple of hours, my daughter died. My first month on house arrest, I barely got out of my bed mourning my daughter. On her funeral, I was forced to stand there alone, monitored remotely by guards, and forbidden from talking to anyone. I thought about a conversation I'd had with an American journalist. He adopted his son in St. Petersburg, and they also told him since he was going to be disabled. But the photo he showed me was of a healthy young man. Alina might have had a chance if she lived in another country. But because of we lived in Russia, my daughter, had to suffer every single day of her life. And now all our children suffer. When I was on house arrest with all possible restrictions, I couldn't go out, use the internet, work, send messages, communicate to anyone. My 14 years old daughter and my seven years old son became adults overnight. They were doing everything for me outside, 
They went to school alone. They were running errands to the grocery shop, to the bank. In 2021, I was convicted to three years of suspended sentence. In 2022, Russia attacked Ukraine. All Russian children immediately became tools of propaganda. Ukrainian children were brought by force from, from Ukraine to Russia. One of my friends volunteered in an orphanage near the border. And something terrible happened. They received over 500 Ukrainian children in one single day. And the next week, they were all gone, scattered across orphanages in Russia. They changed their names, they changed their surnames to erase their identity. I escaped Russia last summer with my daughter, my son, and my dog. Now we live in Vilnius. And oh my God, it's my daughter's birthday today. She's 19, and I'm here on stage, so maybe I'm not the best mom. But uh, she studies politics in university. She understands me well, how important it is to be here. Uh, a few months ago, her classmate from Ukraine hugged me and said, I want to go home. I want to go back to Ukraine. And you know, she was looking at me with tears as if she was saying, please do something. And I promise I will do anything I can. I know Russia's actions can't be undone. But to the people of Ukraine, I ask for forgiveness. Even if forgiveness is impossible, I'm still ready to bend my knees in every city, in every village destroyed or attacked by Ukrainian, by, sorry, by Russian troops. Putin is a criminal. He is a terrorist. He kills Ukrainians. He arrested Mikhail Khodorkovsky. He killed Boris Nemtsov. He injailed Alexei Navalny. And my friends and colleagues, Vladimir Karamurza and poet Artem Kamardin, among many, many others, if I returned to Russia, I would be also immediately arrested. I'm on a wanted list because, as they say, and this is ridiculous, I am a threat to Russia's defense forces. So let me also address to those who remain in Russia today. I'm sure Russian police will watch it. I'd like to express solidarity with the tens of millions of Russians who refuse to participate in Russia's regime and the war with Ukraine, and especially with those who have courage to speak out against it. There are many Russians like me who will continue to organize political rallies, fight propaganda, and advocate for human rights. I told you I am a politician by accident. So as the Russian democratic forces, we are committed to these fundamental positions. The war against Ukraine is criminal. Russian troops must be withdrawn from all occupied territories. We must restore internationally recognized borders of Russia, bring war criminals to trial, compensate victims. Putin's regime is criminal and must be liquidated. Russia's imperial policies that discriminate against ethnic minorities and any other minorities at home and abroad are unacceptable. Political prisoners in Russia and prisoners of war must be released, forcibly displaced Ukrainian adults and children must be allowed to return home. I am a mom 
and one day I dream about coming back to Russia and make it my country a better place where children are loved, where politicians take care of citizens, where everyone has equal rights. That may sound utopian, I know, but I will never stop fighting for the people of Ukraine, for the people of Russia, for our children. Putin's reign must come to an end, and so together we can all be free. No dictatorship, no war. Thank you. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. I'm very honored to speak here today, and I want to thank the Geneva Summit for giving me the opportunity to break a taboo about a horrible practice. When I was nine years old, I was on vacation with my father's family in Côte d'Ivoire when my aunt told me we had been invited to a party. I was happy to go. But when we got inside, it wasn't a party. They put me in a line of young girls, some just three years old. One by one, they were called inside, invited inside. A few minutes later, they came out hysterical crying. What was happening, the other girl didn't know. Finally, it was my turn. I walked inside, and four women seized me immediately. They slumped me to the ground, yanked off my pants and my underwear, took out a knife, and cut deep into my vagina. I could not stop crying. It was the worst pain I had ever felt in my life. Tears streamed down my face and blood flowed from me. At the time, I didn't know what was female genital mutilation. I didn't know the part of me that I had cut out was my clitoris and how that will impact my life as a mature woman. My mutilation was followed by silence. I didn't tell to my mother. Months later, my grandmother told her she was happy and confident that I had been mutilated. My grandmother told her that I will be a good wife for my future husband. Today, I live in France, where I run an organization called Les Orchides Rouges, in English, the Red Orchids. And the one thing I hear again and again is, oh, that is just an African problem, an outdated tribal practice that doesn't happen here in Europe. But I'm here to tell you that you are wrong. FGM is a problem worldwide. 200 million women and girls have received FGM around the world. In Asian countries like India, Thailand, Indonesia, or Pakistan, in African countries like Senegal, Côte d'Ivoire, Guinea, Somalia, and Ethiopia, in Arab states, like Iraq, Yemen, and Oman, 
in Russia, and in diaspora communities worldwide. So if you think your country isn't affected by FGM, you are wrong. In France, where I live, FGM is illegal. And anyone caught performing the procedure face 10 years imprisonment and 150,000 euro fine. But it doesn't matter that it is illegal. The practice happens beyond closed door, in secret, often on holiday. I have met countless European women whose parents took them abroad to visit relatives. And like me, they returned home traumatized with black soap underwear. It is, so you might hear the practice called female circumcision, but don't be deceived. FGMEN is not the equivalent of cutting off the foreskin. It will be as if we cut off a man's entire penis. In fact, some girls aren't just mutilated. They are sewn shut, and then it is the duty of their husband to open their vagina when they are married. It is a brutal, even form of torture, it, and it has long-lasting consequences into adulthood. When I was 22 years old, I met an Italian man, and we decided to have sex. As soon as he saw me naked, he stopped me. Where is your clitoris, he said to me. You cannot be a real woman if you don't have a clitoris. He couldn't get over it, and I couldn't get over that feeling of being a half woman, of being inferior, undesirable, and broken. It haunted me for years. Then, in 2016, I read in a, a story in a magazine about a girl who, like me, had undergone surgery to repair a clitoris. On December 7, 2016, I had a genital reconstructive surgery. I called that day my second birthday. Because when I woke up from the anesthesia, I was a different woman, smiling and serene. That same year, I founded Les Orchidées Rouges to fight for the eradication of female genital mutilation, forced and early marriage, and other types of gender-based violence. Since 2020, we have offered free therapy treatment and support to 650 survivors of FDM at our institutes in France and in Côte d'Ivoire. By reconstructing themselves physically, psychologically, and sexually, survivors gain the self-confidence to follow their personal and professional dreams. At, and the same is true for me. Today, I'm with a loving mom. I'm the mom to an incredible son, and I have never been more confident in myself and in my body. Through my organization, I have met hundreds of survivors, their families, and even cutters. And I have realized that the most important thing you can do right now is to spread awareness about the horrors of female genital mutilation. Tell people that it is not just a West African problem, that there are 500,000 survivors in Europe alone, that every minute six little girls are mutilated, that among FGM victims, one in four dies immediately or later in their life. 
and that it might be a long-standing cultural practice, but we cannot stand for it any longer. People say it has been done since the Pharaoh's time. Who are we to say that our ancestors was wrong? I say that our ancestors was human beings just like us. We can honor our ancestors and choose a more humane path for ourselves, for our families, and our children. No woman or child deserves to go through what I went through. Female genital mutilation must stop now. Thank you. Just checking this is on, great. We have heard some incredibly powerful testimony from our last guest, Marie Claire Anastasia. So we're gonna change things up and Nevshin and I are just gonna have a conversation. Um, so Nevshin, you, um, we're sitting here just a couple of days after Turkey's election on Sunday. And this was very much seen as being the consequential, consequential election. You know, the opposition seemed to be leading in the polls. It seemed like they could finally irk out Erdogan from over 20 years, about 20 years in power. We now have the results, and we know it's going to a runoff, but it seems like Erdogan did very well. You know, he got 49.5% of the vote, and the opposition got just under 45%. So what happened? Were the polls wrong? Well, yeah, that's a good question. I think there's a pattern. Um, we see like all the authoritarian, what they call these competitive authoritarian regimes. It's very similar. It's easy to poll in the bigger cities, metropolitan areas, but I think it's harder for the pollsters to go to the smallest villages deep inside in the heartland of Anatolia. You know, we see similar patterns in Eastern European countries, even in the United States to some extent. So. Usually, like in the other examples of where we see competitive authoritarian regimes, actually Erdogan has been losing in the bigger cities, metropolitan areas, urban youth. Erdogan is losing support there. And actually in 51 cities, he lost votes. In nine cities, he raised his votes, so more rural areas. So this shows us something. So polls were partially more hopeful than they should have been, I think, and also, as people, urban people living in the metropolitan cities, I think we undermine the power of the rural um, in some sense. But though, I mean, let me underline, actually it's not a bad result. Let's remember, this is now a presidential system and Erdogan was not able to get more than 50% in the first round. And it shows us there's more than, slightly more than 50% of opposition who believe in democracy, who believe that there has to be a change in Turkey. 
So, you know, there's been criticism because Twitter was, you know, uh, had blocked certain content that was critical of the government. Obviously, Erdogan, you know, there's a lot of state channels. He censors a lot of channels, as you yourself know, and we'll get into that in a moment. How much of a factor do you think that was? It is a huge factor, of course. Turkish elections are fair. Actually, OSCE just released a report about the Turkish elections they were overseeing. So according to their report, yes, Turkey had free elections, but it's partially fair. So Turkey switched to this Turkish, Turkish style presidential system in 2018, which means there is you know, almost no checks and balances. So it's Mr. Erdogan, he's controlling everything and he's controlling the media. The state media, TRT, is under the heavy influence of the government. Uh, he's in cahoots with some business people in Turkey. They feed each other and you know, he gives some state bids to some business people and in return ask them to buy some media that, to support him basically. So he has a really strong media. But on the other hand, we have a staunch opposition media also. Much smaller, but like they're talking for the opposition. So basically it's a very, very polarized society and very polarized media. But you know what, if you're like a simple person in the heartland of Anatolia, I mean, me, I'm a journalist, that's my job. Most of you guys, you're activists. You're like on Twitter all the time, I think. You're checking news all the time. Simple person in Anatolia, they don't do that. Like, they don't have to do that. They go to work, you know, they work, they come home, they see the news for a bit, and then they spend time with their family. They want a simple life. That's what you want as a human being, right? You cannot deal with problems all the time. So that's what they get from the state TV. They don't even get to hear what the opposition says. They only see Erdogan and how he accuses the opposition. So that's how they're fed. So as Turkey, I always say, we had, we're having, we're going through like a political science 101 class, which is like, why cannot you have a healthy democracy without free media, basically, so, you know. Well, so at the moment, the runoff is set for May 28th, and it seems that um, the ultra-nationalist candidate, so Sinan Ogan, he got about 5% of the vote, mm -hmm. and so now, both Erdogan and Kiric Daralyu, the main opposition, they're both vying for this 5%, and he could endorse either candidate. So he's playing this kind of kingmaker. What do you think is going to happen? That's a good question. Sinan Oğan is a, you know, he's a surprise. He's coming from a very, very nationalist, even rather racist background, actually. So he gets now 5%. Most of people who vote for him are young people. Actually, that's another pattern that we see all around the world. He looks like this anti-system, you know, system fighter uh, person. So he gets the reactionary vote from the young people. Um, he used this anti-refugee rhetoric. That's the biggest, that's gonna be the biggest issue in Turkey because after the uh, civil war in Syria and also Afghanistan, more than I mean, nearly 10 million people have fled to Turkey, and Turkey has a, um, you know, this agreement with the EU. So EU pays Turkey to keep refugees in Turkey. So you know, Turkey gets money for the refugees. But like 10 million people in a few years, that really, um, you know, affected Turkish people sociologically, basically. So there is that anti-refugee dynamic, and Sinan Oğan used that narrative also. So. I think that's the new pattern that we're going to see in the next decade in Turkish elections, a more nationalist and anti-refugee tone, unfortunately. Which is, which is worrying. So, I mean, Erdogan's been in power for 20 years. He came to power as prime minister first in 2003. He was seen as a liberal reformist. You know, he was pro-West. He was trying to join the EU. And then things started to shift, you know, and especially after the 2016 coup. For you, I mean, we, we read this as people who are living, you know, outside of Turkey and analyzing it from that lens, but as somebody from Turkey who was living in Turkey, when did you personally first begin to notice a shift? Me, personally, I noticed in 2011, because in 2009, I moved to Iran. I worked in Iran for like a, a year, and then I came back, and the elections happened, and I don't forget at two o'clock in the morning I was doing live and Erdogan gave a speech and in his speech I was like I listened to that speech and I'm like oh my god because in 2011 after he won the victory he started a speech like talking to the world talking to Bosnia Africa Middle East all the Muslim nations of the world so I realized he's he started thinking that he's the Khalife of the Islamic nations himself so I started sensing that he's seeing himself bigger than he is. Like in the undertone, you could see the, the ambition. 
uh, in his tone, so I think actually it was then. So AK Party, you said in the beginning they were reformists. In the beginning, AK Party was a coalition, actually. They had social democrats with them, they had some reformist Islamists, moderate Islamists with them. But in time, Erdogan ousted all the other big guns in the party and remained as the sole strongman. And then it's, you know, same everywhere. And, and for people just who aren't familiar with Turkey, the AK Party that you just referred to is Erdogan's party. Yes. So you're a journalist and, you know, you were a CNN Turk journalist. As the banner said, you got taken off air because in 2016 you were taken off air and then you were forced to resign. And this was shortly after a meeting between Trump and Erdogan. You said on air that uh, Erdogan was in the White House for 23 minutes. And that was factual, but it was seen as a slight against Erdogan. And then you made some comments about not wanting to be a mother, which was again seen as a slight against Erdogan. And then you were forced to resign. So tell me about that. What happened? Yeah, so my Russian colleagues and friends will understand. It's very similar. We have like Russian trolls, Turkish trolls, pro-government trolls. They're really effective on social media. They start tweeting. They change the social narrative. They change the social basically discussion. They affect that. And these uh, pro-government trolls have been attacking me for like a good chunk of time. And actually they spread some disinformation about me, misinformation about me. They, some people basically went complain to the court. I had to testify several times and this and that. So it was a pattern. It did not happen in one day. And as you said, I was reporting on Trump Erdogan meeting and I said it only lasted 23 minutes, which was factual. But then Erdogan got really offended because he wanted to present that meeting like it was really long. Trump loved him and you know, his best buddies with Trump. He's a, they're both strong leaders, whatnot. So he wanted to present as such, and since I said it was a short meeting, um, he was furious, and then he, you know, through people, contacted my boss, and my boss called me, and he said he cannot work with me anymore, da 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 we had a deal, I had to leave. Uh, that's it, but you know what, it's better than being jailed. Being fired is okay. I managed to find another way. Now I have my own YouTube, and digital media is bigger in Turkey. See, that's what happens when we're talking about this media freedom. Now, since the conventional media is really polarized, and you cannot really hear what's happening. You just, whichever media you turn into, you just hear one party's point of view. So more and more people turn to digital media, like YouTube is big in Turkey. Most people turn to YouTube to watch the news, to get some information, also Twitter, especially metropolitan urban uh, young people. So uh, I am doing all my own YouTube, trying to you know survive uh, basically. So that's, that's what happened, but I was lucky, actually, to be honest, because I had colleagues who were jailed. They had to, you know, spend uh, some years in jail. That really devastates a person and their families. So, to be honest, I was one of the lucky ones. But, you know, it's really interesting to me because you're an example of why people think Erdogan is an autocrat. Because you were taken off air, it's an example of censorship. There is no media freedom. But then you have a YouTube channel, which is very critical of Erdogan. You have over half a million followers. And Erdogan's supporters say, see, she's an example of why we're a free democratic society, because she's allowed to ex exist and be on air. Yeah. How do you respond to that? Yes, that's Erdogan model, actually. So what he cares about is basically holding his own base, which is close to like 50%. He knows he can never talk to other people. He knows he will never be able to get votes from the other side. That's kind of impossible. So he understands that. And this polarization works for him. And he realizes, me and people like me, we just talk to the opposition. Only people from the opposition, they watch us. Opposition water base watch us. His people do not, like, they do not, they don't care about us. They don't care what we say. So he's just, we're harmless for him, in a sense. But this is for today, of course. In Turkey, things change really rapidly, so I don't know what happens like in a couple of months. But for now, that is, that's what's happening. That's why I'm still outside, not in jail, and doing my work. Well, I mean, also, just to point out that Turkey is the fourth most prolific jailer of journalists globally, behind Iran, China, and Myanmar. And that's according to the Committee to Protect Journalists. So look, we, we haven't got enough time to go into all of the issues at play because there's so many, but you know, within Turkey, there's the economy. So inflation is sky high, and a few days before the election, Erdogan announced a, a pay rise of 45% for public uh, workers. 
This, critics have said, is akin to a bribe, okay? That's one issue. Then there was the earthquake that happened in February that people thought would really hurt Erdogan because of all the corruption involved and that people are suffering. Then obviously there's security in Europe and the Middle East, especially with the war in Ukraine, as Putin's kind of, you know, pro-Russia and he's also pro, you know, he has a relationship with the West. So he's, he's in a, it's an interesting position, let's say. And then women. So Erdogan withdrew from the Istanbul Convention in 2021, and this was a convention ratified in Istanbul to uh, protect women against domestic abuse. So with all of these things, they're all big things affecting society. How is it that, you know, he's ahead in the vote, but also this was a parliamentary election as well as presidential, and his party has secured the most support? Yes. I have followed as a journalist both opposition and AK Party Erdogan rallies, and I've spoken to Erdogan Waters. What I saw, they realize economy is in a very, very bad shape. People barely survive. They understand Turkish foreign policy is in a very bad situation. But what I realized is that they do not trust the opposition. They understand it's really bad, but they think who's gonna f the person who's going to fix it is, again, Mr. Erdogan. So I started thinking, and I was listening to, to this panel you know, a couple of weeks ago, where this uh, former defense minister of the United States, Mr. McFall, was talking. He was talking about Ukraine, but he said, you know, in political science, where we're looking at democracies, um, you look at empirical data, you look at numbers. What we cannot see in the numbers is the factor of a leader. A leader can either carry a country towards democracy or not. So coming back to Turkish opposition, why people, you know, although there was this earthquake, although inflation is skyrocketing, why don't people change their choice? I think it ends up in the factor of, of, of a leader. I think this is what Turkish opposition is kind of yearning for. Someone that Turkish people can trust. Someone can get their message easily to both the opposition voters and Erdogan voters. Someone who is more real and reliable. I think that's, that's an important factor. So you're saying that maybe Kilic Doralyu, who is a person who was representing the opposition, six parties, maybe this is more that they didn't trust him. A lot of people have said, and obviously hindsight is a beautiful thing, who knows what would have happened, but that things would have been different if the mayor of Istanbul had been the face of the opposition. Do you agree with that? I'm not a politician, of course, I'm a journalist, but from a journalistic point of view, at least, they could have used the narrative that since Mr. Erdogan is really, really old right now, he, he looks old and beat. So if there was a like, younger candidate, more energetic candidate, at least they could have said, you know what, Mr. Erdogan has done all these things for Turkey, he built bridges, roads, whatnot, but now it's time for him to retire, let's try this new younger guy. Maybe this could have been the case, but what happened, happened. And we should never forget, we should not forget, in Turkey we have at least a 50% of a very resilient opposition with the NGOs, with the civil society, with the journalists. So it's not like we're not in a bad position. We should always remember that. And also the international community, you should guys always remember that too. There's that staunch 50% in Turkey. So Erdogan is not the ultimate winner in, in every case. He barely wins, and he knows that himself. So we're two women on stage, so I have to ask about women in Turkey. Mm -hmm. You know, Erdogan did withdraw from the Istanbul Convention. There is a, a huge amounts of domestic violence within Turkey. What do you think this vote, this election, if Erdogan is back in power, what does that mean for women in Turkey? When I was talking to AK Party water women, they were saying, well, I was asking them this Istanbul Convention thing and this and that, what do you think? Well, they believe in Erdogan so much, they say as women, you know what, Mr. Erdogan would never let us suffer anyways. He's going to be our protector. So he's a personality cult. It's really hard to break that. You know, we're going to understand that. But on the other hand, for women, very questionable period might be starting because because of this presidential system, both sides, they're sort of a coalition. So Erdogan is in a coalition with the Turkish Hezbollah, you know, Hudapar, which is a very, very Islamist party, and also this new Felicity party, very Islamist. Uh, the leader of the new Felicity party believes in conspiracy theories, like if you get a COVID vaccine, you'll grow a tail and stuff. So these people are in the Turkish parliament right now. So it's gonna be like a colorful period. Well, you, you, you know, you made a very good point that Erdogan is just winning 50%, even though that is 
more than the opposition. It's still half of society. So society is very polarized. Whoever wins is going to have their work cut out for them to bring society together. Mm -hmm. Do you think that's possible? It's, it's really hard like that. I mean, as long as Erdogan is in power, I think this polarization is going to continue. But you know what? Societies change, conditions change. And also, sci political scientists say, if a country is a democracy for more than 50 years, you never go back. I mean, the level of your democracy can change. You know, it might get hurt, but you'll still be a democracy. So we have to remember how much, how much ever beat it is, Turkey is still a democracy with somewhat surviving institutions. So I'm also still hopeful. So, you know, we're in this room and there's a lot of people from the UN here and from other institutions. What do you think they misunderstand most about the reality in the ground, on the ground in Turkey? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think it's hard to understand from an outsider how much of a big personality cult Mr. Erdogan is. People are not voting for him because they're stupid or because they're really ignorant. No, but they understand the problems, but they choose to trust in Erdogan because he has that vibe. And second of all, always, you know, yes, international community, they always tend to undermine the opposition and the anti, or like anti Erdogan society in Turkey. That's also, I think, being undermined. So if Erdogan wins, do you think it's gonna be five more years of the same? Do you think there will be elections in five years where he could potentially be out? Well, the thing is, so Turkish economy is in decline because Mr. Erdogan believes he's an economist and he has a theory. And his theory goes like, if he decreases the interest rates, the inflation is going to go down, which is scientifically wrong. But he keeps he insisting, keeps insisting on that policy and uh, we're living in his ex little experiment, basically, as a society. Listen, as long as he does not change his uh, economy policy fundamentally, Turkey will go bankrupt in a couple of years, basically, you know. It will be literally eating each other on the street. It looks like that. So, what he's, but he's a pragmatic leader. I think he's gonna change his economy policy and then we'll see if he will be able to survive. But I will not be surprised in two or three years time, we need to have like an early election. I will not be surprised. So to close us out, tell me what scares you most about Turkey in the future and then what gives you the most hope? Well, what scares me is like, actually, I'm, as I said, I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful that Mr. Erdogan was not able to win in the first round. It, it showed me, especially with the young people, metropolitan uh, people, urban people, are, they are yearning for democracy. That's hopeful. But of course, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm afraid as a woman journalist, you know, for my, in a sense, personal future. And I'm afraid for women of Turkey well, we'll wait and see, but, but I'm really afraid that these fringe groups within the society, these radical fringe groups are now moved to mainstream because of this system, and they're gonna be more loud. So I'm really scared of that. That's definitely something to keep an eye on. Well, we will all be watching on May the 28th to see what happens, and we hope you'll keep up your great reporting. Thank you. Thank you all for listening. In the middle of last year, I was walking through Copenhagen when I received a message from my family. My paternal grandmother had died in Cuba. In the hours that followed, she would be cremated, her ashes would be placed on the Havana seawall, 
and my family wanted me from a distance to be there. I was in Copenhagen because I'd be giving a talk on the freedom of expression in Cuba. The next day, at the time my family was walking over the reefs of the Malecon, I was walking through a canal full of vintage boats, colorful houses, and squadrons of foreigners. As my family spilled ashes into the sea on a blue sky day in Caribbean, I dropped a purple flower, my grandmother's favorite color, which I plucked from a restaurant garden into the dark, cold water of a gray day in Europe. That is how I said goodbye to my grandmother, with whom I no longer had any relationship. On that day, I was still 33 years old, and I had left Cuba for the first time a few months earlier. The Cuban regime had pushed me into exile. At a very young age, I had gone to live with my paternal grandparents. I grew up with them and not my parents. The reason? My grandparents' house, there was two television sets, and I, could enjoy, and I could enjoy the sports channel without conflict, something impossible in my house, where there were about 10 people living and where there was only one television. My grandparents had two televisions because my grand paternal grandfather had fought in the underground movements before 1959. Then, when what they called the revolution came to power, my grandfather became one of Fidel Castro's bodyguards. If you have seen the mythical image of Castro throwing himself out of a tank in the Bay of Pigs, you have seen my grandfather. He is the one at Castro's side. Years later, he would also be the escort of Ernesto Che Guevara, who ended up being the best man at my grandparents' wedding. In the house where I grew up, there is a photo of my, my grandparents' weddings in a corner holding a plastic cup with mojito. It's Che Guevara. In that house, surrounded by photographs of Castro and Che, I wrote my first journalistic articles where I tried to begin to bring to light all the dark areas of my country that had been hidden for more than six decades. By that time, my grandfather had passed away. In Cuba, by law, it is impossible to do journalism beyond the umbrella of the Communist Party. Because the Communist Party, beyond being the only political organization allowed in the country, is the only one that runs all the newspapers, all the magazines, all the radio stations, and all the television channels. Therefore, the Cuban media does not do journalism, but does propaganda. That is why when in the magazine, when I first started with my group of friends to talk about the truth of the life in Cuba and of the system of public health and education system and the repression of the opposition, the regime accused us of violating the laws. And from and then on, they began to repress us. My daily life became one of house arrests, kidnappings, interrogations, jail, threats of imprisonment, interception of my private communications, constant surveillance, and reprisals against my family and friends who were also taken to jail and expelled from their jobs. In addition, they imposed on me a sanction that implied I could not leave the country, a kind of political prison on the island. When all that started to happen, I was no longer living with my grandmother, who told me that all that was happening was the cost of betraying my family. This caused the relationship to break down until it disappeared. The end of our relationship came when a policeman knocked on the door of my new house to give me a police summons without me having committed any crime. My son had been born a month earlier. I went to the station because if I didn't, I was breaking the law. I was not complying with the state order and could be committing a crime. At the station, some men dressed as civilians took me into a room lowered the blinds, stripped me naked, handcuffed me, 
and then put me in a car. The car started and I didn't know where I was going. They forced me to keep my head in between my feet so I could not see where we were going. On the way, they made aggressive U-turns to make me dizzy and vomit. They laughed and asked if I was okay in a mocking tone. It was the day I was most afraid for myself and the day I hated the regime the most. <laughs> there they, take, they stayed for 15 hours for me. They threatened me about ending my life and with jail and destroying my family. I, who had just become a father, feared for the first time for my son, who was only two months old. But in addition, they recorded me without my knowledge. A, f a few hours later, they published my manipulated and edited minage on the evening news. They said I was a CIA agent and that I wanted to subvert the internal order of the country. Like all of Cuba, my grandmother saw the image on the television sets. It was the last time she saw me in person. From then on, she neither answered my phone calls nor received me at her house. With a lot of anger and without so much pain at the moment, I accepted her arbitrary decision. Months later, when the regime forced me into exile, declaring that if I did not leave the country, I would go to jail, I could not even give her a farewell hug. In Copenhagen, as I dropped a flower into the sea in tribute, I understood that the greatest damage the regime has done is to separate thousands of families for the simple reason of thinking differently. A few weeks ago, my son returned to Cuba where, where I cannot return from where he left when he was one years old. He went with his mother to visit my family, my parents, his grandparents, whom I do not know when I will see again. He also went to walk the streets of the country where he was born, whose government continues to denigrate me in its media. Although it was full of rage and impotence for not being able to do it myself, unlike my grandmother, I pushed the hatred aside and asked him to enjoy himself. Today I live in Barcelona. In my living room, there is full of pictures of Cuba and a flag. I want my son to be and feel Cuban, even if he doesn't grow up there. I will not allow them to take away from him, like they did to me, the family, and the country. Thank you so much. We humans develop a strong sense of belonging to our motherlands, and for me that's Venezuela. But my story begins several years before, when my father left Spain after its civil war, and when my mother left Colombia looking for better economic opportunities. They met in Caracas, Venezuela. At the time, it was the richest country in Latin America. The middle class took great vacations abroad and spent money in trending appliances and, and fashions. Fast forward 30 years, and now a shocking 80% of Venezuelans live under poverty, with the highest inflation rate and the second biggest displacement crisis in the world. I'm one of those 7 million people who had to leave everything behind to look abroad for what Venezuela denied us. As a son of migrants, I wasn't raised in a politically engaged family. My mother and father were small business owners and they never even voted. But as Hugo Chavez started dismantling democracy, politics crept into our home without asking for permission. 
The year 2002 was filled with demonstrations, oil workers' strikes, and violent attacks on civilians. I was just 10 years old when my father was shot dead in a robbery attempt at my mother's clothing store. And it turned my world upside down. I developed empathy for those suffering from poverty and inequality and became intolerant of injustice. My mother prohibited me going to any political demonstrations. But then I joined the largest student movement in Venezuela. Unlike a student movement you might have heard before, the Venezuelan student movement is highly engaged with national politics. We organized peaceful demonstrations with several thousands of people, but the regime wasn't going to allow this blissfully. Armed, pro-government student groups wreaked chaos on campus and intimidated those of us who wanted reforms. I was barely 17 years old, the first time they held a gun to my head. In 2001, they had set fire to various offices in campus and even managed to occupy the university principal's office. But their violence wouldn't stop a whole generation joining for future and freedom. My leadership grew at a fast pace. First, I organized local student assemblies. Then I deployed on nationwide tours in 21 out of 23 states, meeting mayors, students, and political leaders. We demanded better study conditions like up-to-date libraries, well-paid professors, safe and clean classrooms, student transportation, and better on-campus security. But we also protested this authoritarian regime that wanted to deprive us of every single right we had consecrated in the Constitution. The right to education, right to vote, to associate freely, to peaceful demonstration, to food, even to safe drinking water. I took part in all of these demonstrations. And in doing so, I gained the support to be elected president of the Students' Federation of the Central University of Venezuela in 2015. I kept studying, but studying itself was a feat. There were multiple years when the university was shut down for six months in a year because professors and workers were paid so little that they went on strike. It was and it continues to be outrageous how the Venezuelan regime has decided to let in public universities die from starvation, literally. In 2016, along with other students, professors, and university authorities, I was invited to come here, to Geneva, for Venezuela's Universal Periodic Review. We have developed a report showing how the government violates the right to education and academic freedom. But when I got to the airport in Caracas, even before I showed anyone my ID, I was detained by police. They took me into a screening room and accused me of smuggling drugs in my stomachs. They threatened to x-ray my abdomen, to what I agree, since I knew that I, they wouldn't find anything. But the hospital was almost an hour away, so they sent me off to be escorted by military officers with rifles. Miraculously, on the way out of the airport, we ran into the mayor of Caracas. He knew me from all the organizing work I've been doing, and he alerted the press. Thanks to this fortuitous event, they did the x-rays without forging them, brought me back to the airport, and I was lucky enough to board the plane in the last second. But it was the first time I'd been detained, and the first time the regime sent a personal message to me that they would disrupt my life if I continue to be uncomfortable for them. And from that day on, every time I stepped a foot in the airport, I was scared of what they could do against me. A few months later, I got a call from my mother, who could barely order a word. She had received some pamphlets at home, signed by a pro-regime armed group, stating that, quote, if I continued to carry, to carry out demonstrations, they would take drastic measures against me. I was disgusted and instinctively wanted to protect my mother. So next day, I went to the prosecution office and filed a death threat suit, lawsuit using footage from the security cameras in our building. But until this day, the prosecution office has done nothing. It would have been naive to expect different. In 2018, I finished university and I joined Voluntad Popular, the political party with the most political prisoners, including Leopoldo Lopez or the leader Juan Guaido. And two years later, in the middle of the COVID lockdowns, I was alone at home with my mother. 
when the president of the Venezuelan parliament appeared simultaneously in all the TV channels in the country. And he accused me and four other colleagues of supplying money and weapons to a criminal gang. Their evidence was just a forged WhatsApp screenshot allegedly obtained from a member of parliament. The announcement ended with a warrant for my arrest. I had enough time to leave my home immediately and went into hiding. Perhaps the heaviest moment of my life so far was hugging my mom that day before leaving home, not knowing when I would be able to meet her again, seeing her watching devastated by the news with tears running down her cheeks. I told her that I would be okay, even though I had no certainty of it. After years of hair prohibiting me going from any, to any demonstrations, now she sent me a message. If they capture me, please don't turn you in under any circumstances. I got rid of my cell phone and spent a couple of nights in an abandoned apartment with no finished floor, no water, no electricity. And the next days were filled with news of arbitrary detentions of fellow party members and their relatives. Six months later, Venezuelan authorities were still looking for me. So I managed to escape to Colombia. But not everybody has had the same luck I had. At this very moment, 284 Venezuelans are unjustly behind bars. Like Roland Carreño, a journalist who has been in prison for 933 days, or Juan Requesens, a young member of parliament. And you may wonder what can be done to put an end to the joke the Venezuelan dictatorship has put upon Venezuelan shoulders. Well, it is not resuming oil purchases from Venezuela, and certainly not complying with the demands, or even stopping the International Criminal Court from investigating Venezuelan regime's crimes against humanity. It's quite the opposite. It's ensuring that Venezuelan people can take part in free and fair elections, and, of, uh, and above all, holding accountable those who distort the people's will. I started talking about my own family migration story, and I've ended by talking about my own exile experience. And it's said that history is cyclical, but we cannot let 30 million Venezuelans to continue suffering in this cycle. We must fight for democracy in Venezuela. Many thanks. It is uh, my distinct honor today on behalf of the 25 co-sponsor organizations of the Geneva Summit that are led by the United Nations Watch and its leader, Hillel Neuer, to present today the 2023 Geneva Summit Courage Award to Felix Maradiaga, a fellow Latin American. Now, Felix is no ordinary Latin American. In a continent uh, that has endured and continues to endure military dictatorships, communist dictatorships, and armed conflicts that have led to hundreds of thousands of deaf people, Felix represents what is best of the Latin American spirit. He renounced a lucrative career in the public sector, in the private sector, in order to become a human rights defender, which means that for the last 16 years, Felix has devoted himself to expose the brutality of the criminal 
Daniel Ortega regime in Nicaragua. During the Geneva summit of 2019, four years ago, just after surviving an assassination attempt in Nicaragua, Felix stood here to denounce the crimes of the Ortega dictatorship, to call for the international community to get involved and to impose sanctions on the regime. From this podium, he denounced the extrajudicial execution, the killings of 350 Nicaraguans that were protesting for democracy. He denounced that 82,000 people had been forced into exile at the time, thousands detained. He called for accountability over 650 people that had been arbitrarily arrested. It is possible to defeat tyranny through civil resistance and nonviolence, Felix said at the time, closing his presentation with a hopeful tone. Two years later, however, in June 2021, the political police of Daniel Ortega kidnapped Felix and threw him into the dungeons of one of Latin America's most horrendous prisons, El Chipote. The regime did this to Felix for daring to announce his candidacy to the presidency of Nicaragua. Hilel mentioned this morning that it is illegal to run from president in Nicaragua, so you, go, you get thrown into jail for doing that. At El Chipote, Felix endured almost two years of inhuman and degrading treatment. For the majority of that period, he remained incommunicado. A little over two months ago, Felix's nightmare ended abruptly and unexpectedly alongside the nightmare of 222 fellow Nicaraguan political prisoners who were forcibly exiled in a plane to the United States and stripped off their nationality. Felix did not only survive the brutality of, of, of Ortega's jail, but only days after encountering his equally courageous wife, Berta Valle, who advocated for his freedom throughout the world, and encountering his daughter, Alejandra, Felix again, he was not deterred, and he again chose to appear, invited by UN Watch, before the UN Human Rights Council to speak on behalf of the remaining political prisoners in Nicaragua. That's the kind of bravery that Felix has showed. Felix, where are you? Oh, Felix. Querido Felix, courage is a choice. You have chosen at repeated moments throughout your life to choose courage, to choose facing dictatorship at a huge personal cost. And this is why you deserve the Geneva Summit's Courage Award. Congratulations. This is some of so real. 90 days ago, I was in a very dark place. And if someone at that time, if I could have spoken to someone, would mention that I was going to be here and see the gorgeous, beautiful smile of my wife, the love of my life, Berta, and to see also the courageous presence of my friend from Cuba, 
from Russia, from Venezuela, from Zimbabwe, who are also my inspiration, it will be very hard for me to believe. I express my deepest gratitude to the Geneva Summit and its partner organizations. I am honored to accept this invaluable opportunity, not this award in particular, but the opportunity to have this global platform to continue to advocate for the freedom of the country I love, Nicaragua. This is an award that belongs to those Nicaraguans who live in a huge prison, those Nicaraguans without a voice, those Nicaraguans who only are asking for the protection of basic human rights and human dignity. So this award not only recognizes the struggle for freedom of my own nation, but amplifies the voices of the silenced. I see that empty chair over there. I invite you to see that chair for a second. And it reminds me that the most important person in this room is each of everyone of the activists, of the human rights defenders, of my own bishop from my diocese of Matagalpa, Monsignor Rolando Alvarez, that empty chair reminds us the real reason why we're here, why we speak, why we fight, and why we believe. Also, this award sends a message of solidarity and hope to the family of political prisoners. It sends a message to people like Eugenia Caramursa that reminds me of my wife. I did not, of course, have any opportunity to see the relentless work of Berta, for example. So when I see other wives, brothers, sons, advocating for the freedom of their family members, it gives me inspiration. This award also belongs to them. It belongs to the family members of those in prison in Nicaragua who stood outside of the prisons every single day with a bottle of drinking water because we were not allowed to have drinking water inside, inside our cell. So families were asked to be there every single day for the quota of water that we have for those 24 hours. Despite the humiliation of my sister, of the family members that went to El Chipote every single day, and this happens in many prisons in China. It happens in Cuba. It happens in Venezuela. So this award also belongs to them. As someone who has experienced imprisonment firsthand, I can testify that even in darkness, a ray of light can be ignited. When the strength of love joins forces with supported hands worldwide, transformation becomes achievable. This moment is significant coming after my personal ordeal. I was arbitrarily arrested, confined in a dehumanizing prison under conditions I am not yet prepared to speak publicly, but one thing I would say, they tried to break our soul and they did not achieve that. I went back because that was the right thing to do. And I will go back to Nicaragua because that's the right thing to do. Since April 2018, Ortega and Murillo has dismantled all civic and political rights. They have shut down 20 universities, 3,150 nonprofit organizations, charity organizations, including the Red Cross of Nicaragua. They absorbed and confiscated their assets. I was here in 2019, and I'd like to share the same message. We know better. We speak truth to power. They may have the weapons. They may have the mechanisms of torture. They may have their propaganda, but we have love. We have compassion. We have a deep commitment to human dignity. And history shows that we know better, and we will achieve our objectives. <laughs> Do not lose faith. Do not let anyone tell you that it is not possible to free Vladimir Karamursa. Do not let anyone know that it is not possible to release our dear barefoot lawyer from China. Do not let anyone tell you that it is not possible to walk in full freedom in Hong Kong, in Venezuela, in Cuba, in Afghanistan. All these girls in Afghanistan also need to know that there are other people talking about them over here. And we will see these videos. And we will see freedom in Zimbabwe as well. We'll see freedom in every corner of the world, but basic human principles are almost a dream, but dreams are possible when we unite. Resilience and unity of human spirit is possible. Together we can triumph over oppression, and we can advocate for the freedom of those who are unjustly imprisoned. Because tyrants utilize 
arbitrary imprisonment as a weapon to divide and demoralize. By imprisoning opponents, they do something that is terrible. They deviate, they distract the political causes. Once someone is arbitrarily detained, the entire family goes through tremendous suffering. That's what they want. They want to distract us because it is important to free those prisoners. But there are entire countries that function as a prison. So the greater objectives is to free Cuba, is to free Nicaragua, is to free Venezuela, and to have also the depicable plans of Putin against Ukraine stopped, because it, that's also a struggle for all of us. When someone kills a man, it kills humanity, so we are all united in that same cause. So I am proposing here an international convention that declares imprisonment of innocent people for expressing ideas, political options, faith, religions, or belonging to a group, for example, as a crime against humanity. I thank those organizations that have accepted this challenge. We need a new treaty, and we need to tell the United Nations that they are not doing their job. We need to tell them that. <laughs> tyrannies need to be treated as tyrannies. They are not democracies. The infrastructure of the international community is built to deal with democracies. Dictatorships have to be treated with whole new mechanisms. Before I say goodbye, I need to also acknowledge people like Victoria Cárdenas, the wife of another political prisoner who I was also with Berta. Once again, love of my life, amor de mi vida. Thank you for your love, for your compassion, for your faith. And let me tell you to every single family member here, you will see your loved ones released with your support. Let us envision a future where fundamental rights and freedoms are upheld. Together, let us ban banish the darkness of injustice. We will see Monseñor Rolando Álvarez, nuestro pastor, también libre. Que el Señor les bendiga. Thank you very much. This is, congratulations, Felix. I mean, this is a very emotional interview for me to do too, because this time last year, I was in this room, Berta was up on stage, and she gave an impassioned speech advocating for your release, and you were in a prison cell, and I remember her speech vividly. And to think that now you're sitting here with Berta, and we're all here together, it's incredible. I mean, how does this moment feel for you? Sabriel? But deep in my heart, I always knew that it was a matter of time. I told myself, Mr. Ortega is close to his 80s. I have more, uh, much more time than he does, but also more faith. And that's the important part. So I must confess that I did have signals that something positive was happening. The conditions in the prison were terrible the first year. And then towards the end of 2022, uh, the other prisoners and myself started to have certain small prison conditions changed. For example, I finally, after almost two years, got for the first time my phone call with my daughter, whom I had not seen for three years. So, you know, let's go back. You spent 611 days in jail, so you were arrested in 2021. And at the time, you knew that you may be arrested. You were preparing for it. But were you prepared? Does anything actually prepare you for the moment? Uh, no one can prepare you for that. Uh, in 2018, uh, um, I was uh, charged with, with, with treason and with so many other charges. There was an amnesty in 2019. I went back to Nicaragua despite those charges. I was placed in, uh, in house arrest for a few months. So when I received uh, the, the notice of the uh, attorney's office that I needed to show myself, I had that call with, with Berta. We recall that very perfectly. I, I told her um, that I was going to be arrested, but there was a big chance that, they, that I was going to be disappeared. So I had to film a video. It's probably the, the hardest thing I've done to try to explain my six-year-old daughter that if I got killed, that it was because of my principles and ask her to forgive me for that decision. But it was the right thing to do. So you, you said in your speech just now that 
you're not prepared to speak about the conditions with, in which you were placed. So just tell me, how did you stay strong in those conditions while you were in prison? When you give suffering a purpose, a meaning, suffering is, suffering is not necessarily something that, that, that is less bearable, but at least has a meaning. So choosing this path is not easy. It's a path that I chose many years ago, even before I, I, I met Berta. I try to avoid speaking about my personal experience, but I, I was an unaccompanied minor. I spent time at a refugee camp as a child, lived with foster parents as a result of civil war. When I went back to Nicaragua, I worked with uh, uh, child soldiers and with people who had lost their limbs because of the war. So having experienced that, my big question is, why Nicaragua continues to function as if, if we are in a stagnated bicycle, you know, those in the gyms that you run and put as much energy as you can and you don't move forward? Well, it's because we have a failed political system based in tyranny, based in violation of, of, of human rights. And since I chose to live in a country I love, which is Nicaragua, the only way to pursue happiness is you have basic freedoms. So someone has to do this job. Well, you've just won the Courage Award, and rightly so. But I want to say there's a lot of courage on this stage. Because Absolutely. while you were in prison, your wife, Berta, was not only advocating, stepping into those shoes and advocating for your release, but stepping into the mother and father role for your daughter, Alejandra. Tell us a little bit about your journey. Well, first of all, I just want to say thank you to the Geneva Summit for being family now. Um, it's incredible when you receive love in, in moments where you think nothing is possible. So I appreciate being here today. And in my case, and we share this, um, the hardest part was to see my daughter every night asking for her dad. And the first three months, you know, I managed to tell her that her dad was doing something else, but then, you know, the truth came through a video she saw, and it was just really hard. And as a mother, not dedicating the time and not being emotionally um, always um, available for her um, causes me a lot of guilty, you know, because I just thought that she, I mean, it was not fair for her to leave what she was leaving. But on the other hand, I saw my daughter grow in many ways and become my strength and my supporter. So I also want to acknowledge that Alejandra fought for her daddy as, far, as hard as I did. So um, now that I see back, I'm just so grateful um, to, to see that we just grow with all what happened. You know, Felix mentioned that he, one of the hardest things he had to do was record a video for her before he went into prison. I mean, what was it like for you, you know, just a real human angle, as, as a wife, you know, I can imagine if, if my husband had done that and I, and I couldn't see him yet, I'm watching a video of him, what was that like watching it and probably clinging well, up to it? Let me tell you this story, and I, I have shared. Before getting married, um, we have this conversation with Felix. <laughs> and he said, look, love, um, there's something I have to tell you. And it's the fact that I'm going to be unfaithful to you with someone forever. And he said, that is Nicaragua. So at that time, of course, I say, well, I love Nicaragua too, so I don't see any problem with that, right? But um, during all our relations, we have been married for 17 years. So I see the work that Feli have done for many years, you know, and his political um, thinking. And, and I, I thought that I was clear about that. But just when we lived what we lived as a family is that I, um, I, I think I was transformed. And I really understand now the unwavering love that he has for Nicaragua and the purpose of that love, which is, you know, fighting for what is right, for what is good, to give opportunity to others. And so when I have this conversation before he was arbitrarily detained, 
And he told me, look, it's possible, possible, it's possible that it's going to happen. And he gave me all these instructions. He, he gave me, for example, um, the name of our international human rights lawyer, Jared Ganser, who became my angel in all of this. He gave me the context of the Geneva Summit and other organizations. I, start, I, I felt a little bit angry at the beginning, right? I felt like, oh my God, he could have leave Nicaragua and come with us, but he didn't. He abandoned us. But then, you know, when I go to places, speak to people, and they say, oh, your husband was here many years ago talking about this. And then I talk with the victims and they say, and they say oh, your husband helped us when my kid was killed. And I just discover in first hand um, the reason why my husband decided to go back to Nicaragua to fight for democracy and freedom. So that little bit of anger and disappointment that I had was transformed to admiration and love and compassion um, for his work and his self. So um, as a woman and as a mother and as a wife, now I can say that happily this have just united united us more and it's wonderful to share as a family you know these values that can really transform our family our country and the world that's i mean that's such a sweet story when Felix, where did this love for Nicaragua and also this foresight to leave these videos almost with instructions for Berta, where, where did that come from? I devoted my entire life as an academic to study our history, my country. I got tired of publishing books and articles and teaching. I decided to go and, and be with the many other heroes that should be also here. But I realized that the fact that I speak another language, the fact that I got to travel the world originally as a director of this uh, office of, of uh, disarmament. I, I will work at the UN for a while. So as some of the people that I've seen here, you know, that we have the choice to be global citizens. Um, we need to use these blessings, if I could put it in spiritual terms, in the service of others that do not know how to read and write, for example, but they're abused displaced. We have here a human rights defender from the Caribbean coast of Nicaragua. I want to recognize Anexa, who is here and has been working and traveling also the world to explain the, the journey of his people in the Caribbean. Uh, the same thing happened with me. I said, how do I put these skills to the service? And it's misunderstood because countries that have been abused by politicians for years, when they see you traveling and talking at the UN, they think that you are just one more diplomat who may, is making a living uh, uh, out of this. Um, I understand that. So I see my people with, with love. And at some point, I had this conversation with my wife. I was working as uh, the top executive of a 500, uh, 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 Fortune 500 company in Latin America. Uh, I also worked for an impact investment firm out of New York. And I said, Berta, this is the right thing to do. I don't want to be this guy in my 60s saying, why didn't, didn't I take this challenge? So we made this, this decision about 15 years ago, and I don't regret it. And I don't regret it because I've had a great partner who has understood this, this very difficult life. But it's the right thing to do once again. And, and, and as you said, you know, it was very difficult. It's, it's easy for us, you know, and people to look now and, yeah, and paint the picture with roses. But how, how much contact did you two actually have while you were in prison? No contact. No contact. So, so yeah. So did you know that he was going to be released? No, either. Like this news just came out the day that they were released. So, so tell me about that day. Tell me about... Tell me about what you knew, and then tell me about what you knew, just on that day. Well, just before that, just to illustrate the case, um, this is an interesting thing. I, I've met in this 90 days with political persons from around the world, and we share you know, notes, <laughs> compare notes with other prisoners. And in the case of Nicaragua, uh, we never had reading materials, no, not even a Bible. As a person of faith, I asked for my Bible. Berta advocated for the Bible, not a Bible no reading materials, no phone calls, no, no access to the outside world. So it was actually impossible to know, but we had some changes in the internal conditions of, of, the, of the prison, as I mentioned. Then on the same day, uh, February the 8th, uh, 
a guard came to our cell and said, dress, uh, gave me an, uh, uh, some clothing, and, and then we boarded a bus, handcuffed, with no information about the outside, the windows were uh, covered, and then I arrived to the airport together with the other prisoners so, so from 11 different detention centers. So you knew something was happening. Something you was happening, and what? then there was a, an American diplomat who I happened to recognize from my previous job, and she was trying to pretend very, she was very composed. I knew that I was coming to the US, so they said, I need to hear you out loud. Are you willing to come to the United States? And I, I have given my word to, to Berta that if that scenario happened, I was going to unite her. So I got on my knees, I kissed the floor, because I knew that was going to be a long time until my next return to Nicaragua, which will happen. I give you my word, it will happen. Uh, and I boarded the plane. And, and you were with 221 other people. Yes, and as we were flying, once we landed, we learned that uh, in those three hours of flight, the Ortega dictatorship had reformed the Constitution to strip us of our nationality, to take away our property, and to make it completely illegal for us to, to go back. So Berta, as well, is stateless at this point, just as myself. Wow, I, I, I want to talk about Ortega in a minute, but first, I want to know about that day. What, what, how was it, what happened? Meanwhile. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Meanwhile, well, I was, I woke up early in the morning, and during the night before, family members um, knew that something was happening, because we had these chats where we share information, and, but it's very confusing, and we say, like, this had happened before, maybe it's just gossiping, you know. So around midnight, I just decided to go to bed, and I say, well, Lord, I, you know, I give you my husband, take care of him, I'm so tired, I have to go to bed. And then in the morning, I wake up early, early, and I receive a phone call from someone from the State Department that we used to work with during this advocacy, and he said, look, Berta, I'm calling you to tell you that your husband it's flying right now in an airplane together with 221 political prisoners, and they're going to Washington, D.C. And he said, it was hard, but we did it. And I just started screaming, imagine, at 6 in the morning, just waking up everyone at the house. And Alejandra, you know, she was so nervous and happy. And then after 10 minutes that I start breathing normal, I ask if I should go to Washington. And they say, yes, you should come and meet your husband. So that was the way I, I, I learned about the release of, of Felix and all the political prisoners. And what was going through your mind? Like, do you even remember now how you got to Washington? You know, it's really interesting because um, I may say that everyone that has suffered this type of situation um, with a lot of stress for a long period of time have post-traumatic stress. And one of the symptoms is that you just don't have memories. So I don't really, like, I'm not sure how did I get from Miami, where we are based, to Washington. Like, I don't, I don't know, but, um, but I just can remember how um, incredible relief I was and how grateful and, and, you know, it's just, for me, it was a miracle. You know, I was expecting Felix to get it out maybe in three, four years. And it happened. And Alejandra did say something, and I want you to, to take this phrase. She said, we were walking through the airport, and she said, Mom, do you realize something? And I say, huh? The most expected, expected things happen in the most unexpected time. And I was like, you know, Alejandra, you're so right. So that um, gave me a lot of faith to see that, you know, Sometimes we don't have hope, sometimes it's just so confused, but what we are expecting, um, it comes. What an incredible little girl. You know, you've ex explained this, it sounds like a movie. I can imagine you getting to Washington, you're waiting there, the planes arrived. Were you nervous? I was nervous and happy. And basically, I was inspired by Alejandra, you know, all the time, like just to see her so well behave, you know, and excited, but well behave. And I have this video that I recorded when she um, see Felix. Felix got to the airport to pick us up, 
and she runs to her dad and hug him, start crying. And I say, look, that is the reason why everything was worth it. And now my hope and my commitment is to allow other family members to be reunited with their loved ones. That is wonderful. It is such a wonderful moment and it's such a great note to, to have this conversation at the end, having heard the stories of so many people. So I just want to ask you though, have you learned now in hindsight what was happening in the back channels and what was happening with Ortega and the US and what actually led to your release? That's a very important question because one thing we know from personal experience is that dictators do not want to be in the spotlight. They, don't want, they do not want to be mentioned in Geneva. They don't want to be mentioned in meetings in New York. They don't want to be mentioned in press releases from the European Parliament. So when dictators see that a political prisoner becomes too much of a problem, then they, have, they, they may consider the release of prisoners. It's not, it's not a magic bullet, but, but um, I saw from every single interrogation, because I was interrogated even after uh, my sentence, uh, they continued to interrogate me for long hours, every single day, for months and months. And every single interview was about uh, the names of organizations. So I knew that something was happening outside. They were so concerned about uh, meetings at the UN, meetings at the Geneva Summit, the Oslo Freedom Forum. They had like huge reports of all the traveling and the advocacy that Berta and Vicky were, uh, were wow. doing. That's so I think that the lesson learned that I'd like to share is that we need to make these extraordinary individuals who are putting themselves on the lines and are now in prison, we need to make them famous in the best of ways. We need to increase the political cost of dictators of arbitrary detention. And also, we need to review the international uh, structure in terms of international treaties. Um, and one of the things that I'm working uh, very hard with together with Friends such as Jared Genser, who was an extraordinary strategic mind, I need to recognize that, is that uh, making as much noise as possible in our case is what really worked. So, but I need to ask you, because do you think this is a sign that Ortega is weakening, that he, that, you know, he had this prisoner release, or as you said, whilst we're in the air, he changed the constitution. He now has no effective opposition in the country. Was it kind of clever on his part? Because now he is more in control in the country. Well, now he's in trouble because he, is, uh, uh, he has a paranoia now. He's uh, detaining new people, which are members of his party, former supporters. And uh, as sad as it sounds, when you study history, that is actually the face or the decline of dictatorships. You know, when dictatorships are uh, against their own supporters, when they face the possible scenario of an implosion is when they're the, the, the weakest. So the fact that they have to use not the classical populism of, 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 of trying to uh, spend a lot of money from the public budget and use their propaganda, now he's using repression against his own people, his own supporters. So that's a direct result of international pressure and it's a direct result of the resilience of Nicaraguans who continue resistance. I must say that the, the, the very uh, sad part right now is that the new face of repression is a religious persecution. They are persecuting the Catholic Church because it's the only institution that at this point is able to speak truth to power. And that's why we are launching this international campaign now for the world to know that Monsignor Rolando Alvarez is in prison. He's the only bishop, at least in Latin America, to be in prison simply for his speaking about his faith, about nonviolence from the pulpit of his church. You know, well, look, I, I need to address something because it's wonderful that you've been released. You know, and we are thrilled and, and it's wonderful that you've been reunited. But for a lot of people who are campaigning for political prisoners to be released, you know, you campaign, you campaign, and then they're released and you think, fantastic, the movie ends happily ever after. But that's not actually true. I mean, now that you're out, you've both changed as people. You've both had profound experiences. What's it been like readjusting to your life and even you know, there is, uh, as we were talking before, being here, and obviously you were thrilled to be with your family, but there's a certain guilt of being out. Talk to me a little bit about the actual reality of life. Yes. Uh, that's, that's interesting. Um, I'm going to say this from more like a 
routine life. Um, and thank you for the question because, of course, we, you know, we share the obvious part. But it's been um, really interesting the last three months to have back Felic at home, especially because, you know, we were living for three years together with my mother-in-law and Alejandra. We have our dynamic in the house, and then Felic comes, and the dynamic change. And you start, like, realizing that only when, you know, you start figuring out things. And it's important to know that after all this work that we do as, you know, human rights defender, there's a private life that also have to be taken care. And we as human rights defenders and activists, we have to be aware of that. We have to take moments to rest, to think, to pray if you are religious, um, because it's important to protect ourselves first and then, you know, try to do things for others. So um, we are in this process of, you know, seeing what, what, it, what are the next steps. You know, I personally would love to have time to spend with Alejandra as a mother. You know, I support Felix and, and his work, and I know that he, he will keep fighting to free Nicaragua. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Going back to your question, I think that dictators know that when they put people in prison, it, the human reaction is to come out with anger, bitter. So in my case, I've been working very hard, as I said, to do an audit of the heart, to try that my commitment to nonviolence, that my compassion, my commitments to civic resistance remains untouched. So it's very important not to hate because if you want to build democracy and freedom out of hate, you will just replicate the same cycle. Let us remember that Ortega was a political prisoner himself. I am the son of a political prisoner. I mean, my father was imprisoned during the Somoza dictatorship, and I saw he was a beautiful man, but he was emotionally very, very bad after his imprisonment during the, the dictatorship. So I think it's very important that as a political prisoner, if we make the decision, which is very private, to continue to advocate and to be a freedom fighter, the decision may well be just to be, have a private life, which is okay. But if we are going to become advocates, we cannot try to trigger change through hate and anger. That's never a good idea. We need to use our own soul and make sure that we will build something new out of compassion. Compassion doesn't mean that we will not persecute crimes against humanity. But through the law, through the international system, not revenge, justice. And so what is next for you, Felix? Well, every single day in freedom for me is a joy to see my daughter. Uh, her smile every morning is a miracle. When I see Berta, uh, food, I've gained 30 pounds since November of last year. Uh, the smells, uh, uh, air, everything that we see, sometimes we take it for granted. But there are people around the world, they just see uh, a ray of light, uh, some sunshine is a gift. But on the other hand, every single day that I'm free, someone else is in prison. Every single day that I'm free, my country is suffering repression. So that's why I have a sense of urgency. So that's what's next, to free Nicaragua. And so have you guys actually had any time together? I mean, since you've been out, you've been on the global stage. Everyone's wanted to have an interview with you. I mean, are, are you guys, have you even had a chance to go on a date yet? <laughs> well, we had a weekend with Alejandra the beach, but not really. Actually, coming here. You're getting me in trouble here. <laughs> <laughs> I, I gave my word that, that in, in I a I spent few a lot of time I, with Berta last yes. year. <laughs> But, um, but, you know, at the end, yes, it would be great to have a vacation, right? Will, we promised Alejandra to, to go to, with her to Disney because she wanted to go to Disney. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, just having Felix at night and sharing a moment and a meal, it, it's, it's enough, I think, in the sense that, you know, we, we know that we love each other and we care for each other. And... We're going to be uh, together. That's another promise that Felix did, at least for right now. <laughs> um, but, um, but yes, I mean, we, we have been spending moments 
of joy. No, of course. And I was joking slightly. But, you know, it's so wonderful because this is such great news. It's, it's so wonderful to have you here, Felix. It's so wonderful to speak to both of you together. And you've really become a symbol of hope to so many people, all of these stories, you know, that we've heard today. And so many people who have loved ones in prison who are in this room, who are watching at home, as an example of what can change and, and, you know, and, and how what you're advocating for can really become reality. What advice would you give to those people who are currently suffering with you know, hoping and advocating for their loved ones to come out? What, what, what piece of advice or hope can you give to them? Well, in my case, the most important part is to keep your faith up, hope. We can lose many, many battles. It's completely human and normal to have a bad day but it's important never to lose the vision, never to lose the commitment of what we are here and, and what's our objective. So in the case of, of the families, they need to have a, a picture in their mind of that day of the release and just keep on fighting, keep on, on, on speaking and keep on sharing the, um, the, the, their, their, their campaigns. And also um, to take a break when necessary. And you, Berta? Yes. Well, I um, agree with everything that Felix mentioned. I, I like this phrase that said that, you know, I'm here because I stand in the shoulders of giants. And it's very important to um, look for help. You know, look for organization, people that have uh, had some experience in, in the situation that everyone is facing. That helped me a lot. And also um, faith. You know, I, I truly believe in, in God and I feel that um, my strength came from, from those moments of praying and, and sometimes just feel like sorrow. But, you know, that gave me the, the, the strength to keep going. Um, and as Fedling mentioned, again, take care of ourselves, you know, as, as persons so we can finish the run and the battle. You are both just incredible people. I want to thank you, Felix, for the courage that you've shown all of us. Berta, the courage that you've shown us, the courage you've shown us together, and the hope that you represent for so many people. So let's give them a round of applause.
Ladies and gentlemen, this has been an intense, emotional, and important day. As you heard last year, Berta was here on this podium speaking, fighting to free her husband, Felix, who was languishing at the time in prison in Nicaragua. Now we see both of them together here with us, giving hope to other families of political prisoners and really to all of us. Likewise, four years ago, a student named Nina from Geneva's Ecole Internationale was speaking here on this podium, and she was pointing to a chair, and she said, the empty chair on this panel is dedicated to Russian, this is four years ago, is dedicated to Russian human rights activist Anastasia Shevchenko, a single mother who has been under house arrest for over two months since January 23rd. Her only crime is being involved with a pro-democracy group that opposes the regime of Vladimir Putin. Today, she is free, and she was one of our speakers. These cases give us hope. Something we heard at the start this morning has stood with me throughout the day. Evgenia, who's the wife of Russian political prisoner Vladimir Karamurza, spoke about how children are smart. They learn not from what you say, but from what you do. They learn by example. Speaking of children, she said, quote, every time I see fear and sadness, speaking of her children, she said, every time I see fear and sadness, but also fury and defiance in their eyes, in the face of inhuman atrocities committed by the current Russian regime, I keep thinking, this is my kid's father leading them by example, teaching them to stand up for themselves and those they love, to face bullies with courage, to never give up without a fight, to be prepared to risk a lot to defend their principles, teaching them to stay true to themselves no matter what. It stood with me because all of our speakers that I've heard today Yesterday at the United Nations opening and today here, representing either themselves or their imprisoned family members in China, in Russia, in Iran, teach us by example. They are the extraordinary people who choose not to remain silent. Their actions speak louder than words. They are an example for all of us. In their testimonies, our speakers shared remarkable and inspiring stories to shine a light on human rights abuses, to build pressure for change. For them, I know it means a lot. For all of us, listening to their testimonies is necessary, but it is not sufficient. Our responsibility is to ensure that those who are oppressed, who've risked everything to speak out and tell the truth, from the prison cells of Moscow, Harare, or Tehran, our responsibility is to make sure they know they are not alone to raise global awareness, to ensure this translates into change on the ground, including by release of political prisoners. So while we thank all of you for joining us at the 2023 Geneva Summit, our responsibility is to ensure that the fight for basic human rights is a constant year-round commitment. Let us not forget that in just one month, across the street, nations will assemble for the Human Rights Council. Our responsibility is to ensure that the appalling situations we've learned about here today are put squarely on the international agenda. One powerful way you can help us is by expanding our global audience online. Please share, like, retweet Geneva Summit posts on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, along with the hashtag Geneva Summit 2023. You can watch and share all the videos on our YouTube page, follow our courageous speakers on their social media accounts. It's vital to share their stories, not least to make sure no one at the United Nations or the international community can ever say they did not know. I want to thank all of our incredible speakers who testified about human rights abuses, difficult experiences that they've had around the globe, including Afghanistan, China, Cote d'Ivoire, Cuba, Hong Kong, Iran, Nicaragua, North Korea, Russia, Tibet, Turkey, Ukraine, Venezuela, and Zimbabwe. Congratulations once again to Shima Baba A for receiving this year's International Women's Rights Award, to Felix Maradiaga for receiving the Moral Courage Award. Thank you to Melissa for her magnificent interviews. I want to thank all of our dedicated interpreters, photographers, videographers, and logistique. Finally, on behalf of our 25 co-sponsoring human rights groups from around the world, I want to personally express our profound appreciation and gratitude to Sheila Raka, Barbara Brizard, Eileen Ergil Amsalem, to Emma Waxlax, 
to Vasia, Lily, RT, Jilly, Lewis, and Sam, and the entire team of Geneva Summit staff and volunteers for their magnificent work and dedication over many months. I want to especially thank our leader, Shayla, who gives her all, her meticulous preparations, her creativity, her innovation. I'm going to say it again because she wasn't in the room. I want to especially thank our leader, Shayla, who gives her all, her meticulous preparations, your creativity, Shayla, your devotion to our speakers, your many, many sleepless nights over a very long time to organize once again yet another superb Geneva Summit. With that, I thank all of you in our audience in this room and watching online for participating in the 15th annual Geneva Summit for Human Rights and Democracy. I look forward to seeing you once again next year at the 2024 Geneva Summit because sadly our work must continue on all the difficult and painful human rights situations that you've heard about here today. Let us hope and pray and do our part, whatever we can and must, so that we will have progress to report. I leave with the words of Nobel Peace Prize laureate, the late Elie Wiesel, quote, we must take sides. Neutrality helps the oppressor, never the victim. Silence encourages the tormentor, never the tormented. Thank you very much. I invite all of our speakers to please come up on stage for the final presentation uh, and group photo. All of our speakers, everyone who appeared on stage, speakers, interviewers, presenters, will you please all come on stage for our group photo. I also want to ask all of the Geneva Summit team of staff and volunteers if you can please also come on stage and join for the photo.